Hello and welcome to Wild Weekend Alive. I'm Jamie. Now, if like me, you've been inspired by Sir David Attenborough's brilliant Wild Isles TV series and want to go wild to help nature in your area, this is absolutely the place to be this morning. You'll be able to watch practical demonstrations, meet our special guests, and be inspired by people like you who have brought a splash of colour to their towns and cities. And we'll be answering your wild planting questions. You can join in by putting those questions on the YouTube chat and also take part by posting and sharing your wild photos on social media using the hashtag MyWildSpace. So who are we? Well, the Wild Weekend Alive team is from the Save Our Wild Isles partnership, and that's WWF, the RSPB, and the National Trust. And we're here at the National Trust, beautiful, uh, it's sparkling in the sunshine all around me, Castlefield Viaduct in the centre of Manchester. Absolutely amazing place, and we'll be talking more about that later. But I'm not here on my own. Let's go over to Jenny and Adrian in the demo area. How are you getting on? Hello. Yes, indeed, it is a really magnificent morning. The birds are singing, the bees are buzzing around. A really cool place. Uh, and we're going to be here all morning in our demo zone, showing you how you can help your local wildlife. Um, first up, we're going to create a place for solitary bees to lay their eggs. But Adrian, before we get started, what is a solitary bee? Yes. Is it just lonely? What's uh, going on? You can on? say that it is in a kind of way. Uh, if we start with what it's not. Mm. So a honeybee, we know a honeybee, there's one species. Bumblebee, pretty much everybody knows about bumblebees. There's about 25 species in the UK. Solitary bees, there's about 225 species. Wow. And even in an average back garden, you might have 20 or 30 different species. And they're solitary because they don't form a colony, but the queens lay their eggs in their own little nesting chambers. Okay. All right. Well, let's have a look at these nesting chambers. I believe you've got something prepared. I have, because what, what I wanted to do for Wild Weekender was give people really easy things that they could do in a very short space of time. That sounds good. And you might have seen the bee hotels, which are they're a bit like a bird box with lots of tubes in yep, them. Yeah, I know the ones you mean. They're great. They work really well, but they're quite difficult to find all those tubes. Yeah. So here's an easy way to create something that's full of tubes. I made one earlier. Cool, OK. Oh. Now you don't need a log <laughs> quite of this size, but this is all that you need. You need uh, a log with a flat face for it and a drill. And I'm not going to do the drill sound while we're doing it. And it's just a case of drilling lots of holes in the face of the wood block. What's really key is that you do different sizes of drill bits. So okay. I've got between about a, a four millimeter and an eight millimeter here yeah. because there are different sizes of solitary bees, all those different species, big ones, little ones, and they want different sizes of holes. It is important to go as deep as you can. Now here's the really clever bit with solitary bees. They like a long tunnel because the female lays this series of eggs from the back to the front of the chamber, sealing them up as she goes. The ones at the front hatch into males the ones at the rear hatch into females. No. So the males come out first, so they're ready to scout for females when they emerge later from the tunnels. Isn't that crazy? Wow, mind blown already in what, half past nine? <laughs> this is insane, brilliant. I've got two final things to say about this. The first thing is you need a little bit of sandpaper. Okay. Because when the bees arrive at the nesting chambers, they'll spot whether there are little splinters or not at the nesting holes. The females do an instant risk assessment as to whether they're going to snag their wings oh. on the holes. So you do need to sand over those holes so that it's nice and smooth for them. You don't want any snagged wings. Indeed. And the second really important thing is that this must face the sunshine. This isn't something for a dark position. Okay. This is a sunny, sheltered position because they love the heat. Now, I've got some pictures of ones that I've created for, for my garden that I think we're going to be able to show for you. Uh, there's me placing them. So you can see, you could take just a little log and yet you can fit in maybe 50 holes into a tiny log. Yeah. Uh, and they, they're taken really readily. My logs went in and they were used by bees. This is a leaf cutter bee carrying a leaf. They go and cut little semicircles of leaves carry them back to the nest, chew them up, and that creates the pulp to seal up the nest. I have seen that before, like a little plug at the end. Absolutely. And then you know that the nesting chamber has been used. And you can get really creative with this as well. I didn't get creative this morning when I drilled these holes, but, um, oh, there's a sharp-tailed bee, which ooh. is um, actually coming to find out whether other bees have nested. It looks for other bees that it can um, utilise their nest. 
And there's oh, the I one like that I've, I've got at home. <laughs> now, that's as creators of I get. Well, I think the viewers can get even more creative with the, uh, the shapes that they drill yeah. into the nesting column. So it's something that's great for all the family to do. The kids can draw the pattern. You can use the drill. All happy. Great stuff. I love that. I think I might have a go at that. Sounds fairly straightforward. And it's so great to help the bees, of course. Um, well, if you haven't already, please sign up to the Wild Weekender. So we can give you a downloadable guide um, when you do this. It will be into your inbox and it's full of tips and inspiration and ideas. Uh, there's more in the link in the chat. Uh, and then also, please, please share your pictures. We'd love to see what you're creating and what, you're, what you've done, what you plan to do, um, what you're doing this weekend and use the hashtag MyWildSpace. Now then, we have got a really nice, inspiring story coming up. Grow Speak is a community garden in Liverpool where derelict land has been transformed into a thriving space, which is also transforming the lives of local people. We had a plot of land which was um, causing us no end of issues, antisocial behaviour, fly tipping, um, cars being burnt out, drug use, which just generally the pits uh, in the heart of our community. Um, so we needed to do something with that and the residents in the area were really quite fed up. And we put a mix of funding together um, so that we could start something on that, on that site. Um, we delivered some fantastic outcomes from that site. Uh, the partnership, is, partnership working is fantastic. So we tried to do things on there before. You know, we fenced it off to the front elevation. We'd allow tenants to go on there and build some uh, raised beds. and It just didn't work. It just needed a big player. Um, and that was... My role to go and get that big player, that big player, thankfully, was uh, Groundworks. Before Groundwork came along to this site, um, it was derelict, uh, suffered with vandalism, um, drug dealing, um, you name it. It, it, it had it all. Today, it's, um, I'd say it was a community-based hub where people from the speak community can come along um, engage in uh, horticultural activities, uh, skills, uh, building skills. Um, not only that, but they can interact with other people, so it's a place to socialise as well. But particularly with what's gone over the last two years with the COVID situation, it's invaluable to people uh, now for them to have an open space, a piece of green space that they can go to and interact with uh, other people. For me personally, um, it, I, I haven't worked for a number of years, so for me, to, for me to come here, it's built my confidence up, my self-esteem, um, my mental health's improved immeasurably since I've been coming here, um, and it's just like giving me a, a feel-good factor about coming here and again just interacting with people. It's been really um, good for me to do and engage, and not only that, but just a pass any knowledge I've got on to other people who've come here as well. It's fantastic, we give food to um, care homes, uh, food banks, uh, SLH, I've got a marketplace which takes some of the produce off the site which is then distributed to people in the community. So this place is invaluable to a community like Speak and if this kind of initiative can be developed across other places in the North West then that would be totally beneficial to other communities to engage in the kind of things that we've engaged with here. I'm Nancy, Nancy Ng. Well, uh, I'm, uh, I just moved in recently, not so long ago, last, last year. And uh, so uh, trying to explore what is around. I found this girl's break, which was something that I've been looking forward to that, uh, you know, after I retire, I want to do something, you know, to learn how to grow vegetables. This is, this is part of it that started me. And then I got myself involved, volunteer, learning as well. I was looking around there, so this grow space. I was, I was curious about it. And then after that, I found out there is this community garden. Oh, from there, really, we love this place. Come, you know, here you have uh, food. Sometimes, you know, when, when the Friday, they have this lunch and then you can come and, look and get to know each other, get to know what's happening and get to be able to sort of like offer whatever, you know to the community, this is something. And we can grow plants and give it to the, you know, those who are in need. And this is something which I think is, is something I would love to do. And uh, hopefully more people will be able to be involved, you know, yes.
Well, that was amazing. And what I love about that video is the sense of community that's built up around what was once a derelict area and is now this kind of bustling, thriving hub for people. Talking about communities, um, I have a guest now and it's Clara Steiner from WWF. We're going to hear about the uh, Save Our Wild Oz Community Fund that's been set up by WWF, the RSPB and Aviva. Clara, welcome. Welcome to Wild Weekend Alive. So nice to have you here. So tell me all about the Community Fund. So we know the vital role that communities play to protect and restore nature across the UK. So to harness this power, WWF RSOB have teamed up with Aviva to create the Save Our Wild Isles Community Fund. For this, essentially, um, it's a two-to-one match funding. So for every one pound your group raises, Aviva will match you two pounds, giving you three pounds overall. Wonderful. And what kind of, thing is, what kind of things are people doing so far? So we are looking for groups to boost biodiversity in their local area. So we already have an incredible range of community groups taking action. So for example, we have a group in Northern Ireland that are restoring nature in their local BMX park, which is really, really exciting. And we have a group in Scotland, in Glasgow, that are working with local refugees who don't often get to, you know, go out, often live in hotels, to essentially bring them out into nature. They're putting up bird boxes, you know, setting up badger homes, planting trees. It's really nice stuff. So bringing people together through nature and through, yeah. through growing and planting. Yeah, definitely. So there's also a group in Carmarthen, Wales, that's like the restoring seagrass. Um, in their local bays and it's just really nice you might have seen them on the 60 minute film so yeah it's really nice. oh in the extra wild eyes film yes that was actually brilliant i love the seagrass story it's, it's gardening but at sea in, yeah. on the, on what the more coast could you want <laughs> um, how can people get involved because people are going to be watching thinking how can my community get access this this fund so if you want to um, get involved in the fund or you would like to support a local group in your area um, you just head to the Save Our Wild Isles webpage and within that page you will be able to find the community fund. All the information should be there, or will be there, um, and yeah, you'll be able to find everything and find more information. Thank you very much and we're going to try and pop that link in the YouTube chat as well so it's easy for you to get to. Um, we're going to look at another community now. This is a, a brilliant, motivated community in Belfast who have brought a kaleidoscope of colour to grey alleyways in their city. have a big big influence it's magical it really is it's like Narnia for us <laughs> it's just perfect in the Holy Lands and all over Belfast we have alleyways from the way the houses were built and they're just a forgotten treasure really and they can all be used to bring a bit of greenness into our lives, bring a bit of beauty back into our lives, bring a social space back into our lives. And when these houses were built, they would have been a social space all of those years ago. And we've just forgotten that that's what they are and that's what they could be again. When we first started out, because of the opposition that we encountered from local HMO landlords, we decided to get as much publicity as possible, so we entered a lot of competitions. And we won in every single one. Got a lot of uh, publicity and a lot of support. We were very aware that we live in a very polluted environment, and the environmental improvement is striking. You can just feel, smell the cleaner air. We've attracted more birds, more bees, more wildlife in the alley with all the greenery. Don't forget your shovel if you want to go to work, eh? Being an international student, I never realised how important the community is. Love what surrounds you, you know, whatever it is. It's a concrete jungle, try and find a way to love it and turn it into something. You know, it doesn't have to be an alleyway. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling my mum like that. I know we've never seen one before either, and a lovely neighbour.
The enjoyment you get out of watching something grow and flower and then it's it's a new life being born every year. Doing something physical with your hands, being in the soil, you know, it's very grounding. That just moved it out of the way. <laughs> and one of the things that I have learnt now is just give it a go. And it's not if it doesn't work out that season, it doesn't matter. You live and learn. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've known Bridget quite a long time, and so when they saw that ours looked so well, they developed their own and theirs is really, really something else. It happened very organically. Once a few plants came out, a few more plants came out, and before we knew where we were, virtually everybody had joined in. Belfast is a very divided city, and this area that we live in now is not a divided community, it's a mixed community. And what the alley has done has been it has created community for all of us that we didn't really have before. The good thing is we do have, you know, we've had loads of birds, you know, we've had rains, we've had... Um, Little, you know, little blue tits, we've had robins, um, oh, we've had a whole range of wee birds just coming along the top of the, of the, uh, the walls. It's magical, it really is, it's like Narnia for us, you know, <laughs> it's just perfect. Hi, well, that was great, wasn't it? Yeah. Really nice to see that community coming back together, coming together and transforming something that, well, kind of like here, actually, would have otherwise been kind of a nondescript, sort of unloved area. And it just takes a bit of thought, a bit of imagination um, and a bit of action to just do something. And yeah, what a great result. Yeah, indeed. I love seeing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've got some questions from you, the viewers, um, which I'm going to ask Adrian, our guru, our expert, um, so the first one is Charlie in Hereford is asking, is peat-free compost as good as peat-based? And this is a really, really hot topic, interesting question. So, yeah, what would you say? Yeah, and, and the reason why it's such a hot topic is, of course, peat and its extraction from wonderful wild habitats means that you're destroying wildlife at the same time that you think you're helping wildlife yeah. by then growing something in it. It's counterintuitive. Isn't it? Yes. But it's, um, it's so... Uh, important to therefore shift on to peat-free alternatives and I know mm. that many people already are yeah. um, and the plants that we got here today all of the things that we're showing today are all grown in peat-free compost and I think uh, the evidence speaks for itself really these are all really healthy plants that are grow going to grow up to be wonderful flowering things for wildlife and other pollinators I've been using peat-free compost now for 20 years nothing else but peat-free compost I use it at home I yeah, can't tell the difference and they're getting better and better. Yeah. You do have to adjust your, your growing style a little bit with them, um, but you, you just read your plants and see how well your plants are, are yeah. doing. And I have no problem whatsoever with it, and I'll advocate peat free till the cows come home. Well, that's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Grand. Um, well, the next one is um, Jill. Um, she is asking about the, the, the menace of the gardener. I don't want to say menace, ah. but slugs. Oh, I wondered where you're going with that one. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do about them? Uh, so with slugs, I try to not kill anything in the garden, mm. inevitably. Accidentally, you might do something when you're digging. But with slugs, I don't have any lethal control whatsoever with them. Let's start with the fact that not all slugs eat live plants. Some of them are busy, they're what are called detritivores, eating dead plant material okay. and helping in the decomposition process. Okay. And indeed, some of the big ones that you look at and think, whoa, there's a whopper that's just going <laughs> to munch my lettuces to nothing. They're primarily eaters of dead leaves and, and dead plant material. That's good to know. Okay. So don't see all slugs in the same bracket. What I do 
to help with the, the slug control is where I have some plants that are particularly susceptible, I go on slug patrol every evening with a torch. It only takes five minutes and it takes me out into the garden. I can spot the bats going overhead yeah, nice. and hear the owls calling. And I just pick the slugs off my particularly choice plants and move them somewhere else. Because mm. that is when they're most active, isn't it? Sort of dusk. Uh, they need that moisture and, the, and yeah. that darkness. Um, so that's when the slugs are going to come out. Okay. If there's some plant which repeatedly just gets eaten by snails or slugs, then there's another 70,000 plants I can choose from to put in my garden. So Very true. I will move on from something that's really susceptible and go, maybe that's not the plant for my garden. Yeah. Let's go something else exciting. Fair enough. And then, of course, there's the thing that those slugs are part of our garden ecosystem. They're feeding our slow worms and our frogs and our hedgehogs and our blackbirds. Yeah. And, uh, they've got a place in the garden. Of course. So it's... I think creating that balanced system within a garden and recognising there are going to be some things that in the past we might as gardeners have called pests. No, they're just part of that community. And if you create that balanced community, everything has got its place. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Um, if we have that sort of balanced ecosystem in our gardens, you know, if we're attracting birds or um, frogs, you know, they'll eat mm. slugs. Mm. So if you've got a lot of wildlife in your garden, um, they might do the work for you. And that's what I like, having those helpers. Yeah. Just keep everything in check. It's Great. perfect. OK, that's cool. Win, win, win for everybody. Well, I'm going to head back to... Uh, actually, no, before we go back to Jamie, please do send us some more questions because we will have another Q&A section later on in the programme. Uh, but for now, back to you, Jamie. Thank you very much, Jenny and Adrian. Now, we've had some lovely photos sent in by um, people who are giving nature a home, who are bringing those pollinators into their local areas. And these are from uh, Belinda Miller from Fintray Gardening Club. And this is from the, uh, a recreation area in Hatton of Fintray in Aberdeenshire. It was inspired by the area not being cut in 2020, and Fintray Gardening Club took on a strip of ground in 2021. With Aberdeenshire Council support, they sowed locally collected wildflower seeds and the council supplied some wildflower plugs. Look at those beautiful dandelions there. No great impact in the first year, but in 2022, it was awash with colour and buzzing with pollinators. This year, they're hoping for even greater impact as the wildflowers dominate the grass, thanks to the area now being covered with yellow rattle. And yellow rattle, as you may know, is very helpful in a wildflower meadow setup because it really kind of suppresses the grass. It semi-parasitizes on the roots of the grass. So if you want to keep the grass down but have lots of flowers, yellow rattle is the plant that you really want to have in there. So thank you very much for uh, sending those in, Belinda. And thank you, Fintray Gardening Club. Now, I'm going to be talking a bit more about Castlefield Viaduct itself and we're sat here surrounded by beautiful greenery um, we've got trams going either side but we are in an absolute little oasis so my guests now are Beth and Max from the National Trust hello, hello. welcome to well wake, welcome to your own site but welcome <laughs> to Wild Weekend Alive thank you very much Thanks. for coming in no worries. Um, this is beautiful I'm just blown away by this place it's absolutely stunning um, can you tell us a bit about the history of this place so it was first opened in 1892 and it was built to transport people and goods into the heart of Manchester city centre. And it was running as a railroad like that um, in the peak of the Industrial Revolution till about 1969. And since then, it's just been abandoned. It was reclaimed by nature. There was lots of silver birch trees and lots of wild strawberries, but it didn't really have a solid purpose. And now Manchester's kind of going for a bit of a transformation, really trying to build up its green space. And it's, we've got lots of really great examples in the city um, and we want to be one of those. So there's been lots of different designs about how to transform it. Um, and we've worked with lots of different communities and lots of different organisations to kind of bring a different like, take on what it means to have green space in the city. It is absolutely stunning. How was it transformed? How did this happen? So um, a huge part of the start of the project was Castlefield Forum, who are literally the local community group, but they have a charitable status and they do some amazing work. So they were campaigning for a long time to get something done up here because, like Beth said, it wasn't providing a purpose um, in a true sense. So the National Trust were really happy to come along. And what we're doing at the moment is the pilot project. So we're researching who could benefit from a permanent green project up here. So um, we've put in our garden, um, we've used peat, peat-free planting, peat-free soil, and we've got huge water butts um, that are watering the plants. 
and we've done a really wide range of planting. So there's lots of species here that are kind of local native plants and that have naturally been growing in this area, but also lots of really interesting tropical plants. We've done lots of scented plants mm -hmm. and ones that are tactile to make a really sensory garden that I think young people really enjoy. Um, but we've also left portions of the viaduct to nature. So we've got a whole half of the viaduct that's left as it was when we came up here and started the project. So you can still see how nature reclaimed the space in the past six years that it was out of use. And people find that really interesting as well. But like I say, a huge part of the project at the moment is finding out what we want to do with the future of the viaduct and what we want to do in the future with the other half of the viaduct. So um, we're inviting the public up to the space, we're welcoming them in, and we want to hear back what their thoughts and feelings on the space are and what they see the viaduct and the project here becoming in the future. So we're really open to all kinds of feedback and ideas, and um, it's been really positive feedback so far, which is great to hear that people want green space like this. It's lovely, isn't it? You've answered my next question about the future, really. You've covered it well there. So um, what I was going to mention as well is sitting here and, and sort of rehearsing and sitting here being immersed in it, there's so many birds. We had robins and dunnocks. There was a goldfinch, pied whitetail. Um, you can hear birdsong occasionally. And yesterday we were sitting, and you can't, you can't see this on, on the screen, but just behind me is a pond, a lovely little pond. And there was a blue tit having a bath. Yeah. Oh, so fabulous. sweet. So yeah. nice. It, it, what else have you seen up here? So we've got viaducts that are in the pond. Viaducts. Viaducts. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. <That's> viaducts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're hopefully going to do some kind of like a school group session called the Viaductlings, yeah. which I think will be really oh. sweet. Um, and we also have Stella the Sparrowhawk, which joins us infrequently and yeah. has her dinner up here on the yeah. viaduct, <laughs> uh, which is also really exciting. But we see tons of nature up here, a lot of uh, it's way more than we expected, like especially like with the bees, like the amount of diversity that we find here is amazing and we're starting hopefully to see the butterflies come out and last year it was beautiful so we're hoping for the same again. Oh thank you, you're doing a wonderful job here, thank you so much. Um, I, it just, it's like being on holiday sitting up here, it really is, it's like a little oasis in the sky, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, and it epitomises what we're talking about at the moment which is bringing green into urban spaces. And a lot of that is wildflowers. And someone who really loves wildflowers is WWF ambassador, Professor John Drury. So he's gonna have a look now at his five favorite wildflowers. WWF, and especially pleased to be part of this wild weekender alongside the RSPB and the National Trust. My few minutes with you are about wildflowers. You'll find them outside, so I encourage you to go and enjoy a botanical journey of discovery out there. Look carefully at fields, waysides, hedgerows, maybe even plant some wildflowers of your own. Each species isn't just beautiful, it's also entwined with our own history and folklore. I've written a few short paragraphs about five species I especially like. The foxglove, an imposing and enchanting plant of open spots in woodland on acid soils, whose flowers have intricate patterns of speckles to attract bumblebees. In Ireland, the story goes that bad fairies gave the flowers to foxes for their feet, empowering them to prowl silently at night, while another name, Dead Man's Bells, warns us that the alluring foxglove is the source of a deadly heart drug. Ladies' Bed Straw, a delightful plant bringing patches of yellow to open fields, the sprays of little flowers are pretty, but the main event is their laugh-out-loud, intoxicating scent of warm hay and honey. Crouch low to drink it in and remind oneself that it was once used for stuffing mattresses. The roots and stems, meanwhile, yielded a red dye for textiles. Cowslip. Popping up in meadows and pastures, a close relative of the primrose, but with smaller flowers on erect stems. Shakespeare had it right. Pert and dainty, warmly scented, they were his fairy favours in Midsummer Night's Dream. Cowslips make a honeyish, pleasant country wine, and boiled flowers were ingredients for ointments for skin blemishes, perhaps because the flowers themselves are often freckled. Common poppy. The poppy's splashes of scarlet are familiar on roadsides and the edges of farm fields, and later in the year the distinctive seed pods will scatter their tiny charges as they sway like so many pepper pots. The seeds wait patiently in the soil until it is disturbed. First World War battlefields turned red with poppies, which became a symbol of spilt blood and therefore remembrance. 
the bee orchid. A gorgeous plant on sturdy stems, at home on disturbed ground. Chalk grassland and Iron Age earthworks are favourites. A master of deception, its flowers have broad velvety tips, the patterning, the fine hair and even the faint scent of a female bee, all evolved to convince passing males to attempt to mate with it and thereby carry away its pollen. Remember, the entire purpose of a flower is to be attractive, to attract some critter that can be commandeered to transport the flower's pollen, usually in exchange for some sweet nectar. So when you're looking at flowers, please enjoy the insects too. Have a wonderful and exceedingly wild weekender. Well, that was fascinating, and we're going to be looking at, in a little bit more detail at some of the stories around plants with Jenny and Adrian a little bit later. Joining me now is Rachel Webster, the curator of botany at Manchester Museum. Welcome to Wild Weekend Alive. Thank you for coming. It's an absolute pleasure to be on the Castleville Viaduct this morning. Thank you. And you, you know this site well, I think, so you've been here a few times. Yeah, we've been with the museum a few times, seen some objects, looked at the wildlife visiting. It's been really beautiful every time. And what you're coming to talk to us about today is the City Nature Challenge. There's a surprising amount of nature in cities, isn't there? Absolutely, and sometimes we don't actually know that much about it. So conservation efforts are often focusing on the, the special scientific sites that are nature reserves, but actually finding out what lives in and around the places that we live uh, and can make a home alongside us is really fascinating. Manchester's pretty good for nature? Yeah, it is. So... Um, we have some really wonderful parks uh, and a lot of street trees, so there's, there's things that move in and, and pass through. It's, it's quite a beautiful city to be out and around and seeing what's about. So the, the City Nature Challenge then is happening at the same time as your Wild Weekend uh, over the bank holiday weekend, and it is the world's largest wildlife spotting event. So there are going to be over 480 cities worldwide wow. this year who are going to be uh, encouraging their citizens to be out spotting wildlife and sharing them through the, the free wildlife app, iNaturalist. How do you get iNaturalist? It's it's quite easy. You can download it on your phone or you can look at it on uh, a computer. It's completely free. Um, if you visit the citynaturechallenge.org.uk website, it can give you hints and tips on how best to get the most out of the app yeah. and to tell you what's happening over the course of the City Nature Challenge this weekend. Um, I find it's really good for things that you're not so sure about identifying. Yeah. So if, if, you're not, uh, if you're not that into wildlife recording, you're just interested and you want to find your feet in working out what things are, it's got a little bit of AI to help you identify so what you've taken a photo of. And, and you take a me. photo yeah. and you can upload it either there and then or when you've got home and you've yeah. got Wi-Fi, you can upload it onto the, uh, from a camera onto your computer. It helps identify that photograph and then there's a network of specialist uh, naturalists who will help you identify that find through that photograph. So it's a really good way to get in and, and sort of hone your skills really on identifying wildlife. It's a great opportunity to learn, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, and to get out there and be part of a, a kind of bigger effort. So all of the data that's collected will be helping put nature on the map across the UK so that that'll help scientists, researchers and conservationists to plan where to do activity, how nature's changing and to help address those challenges that we've got. So if people want to take part, they get our naturalists, they head out to yep. the city and how long do they need to spend? Well, uh, yesterday I just popped out in my lunch break and I found uh, about 15 different plants. So really you don't have to spend an awful lot of time, obviously if you're going on a big hike somewhere or spending the day in a country park on Bank Holiday Monday, then you can do it all day long. But uh, really taking that time and uh, spending time taking notice in nature, you'll be surprised at how much you can find in quite a short period of time, really. Absolutely. Now, you've seen a few interesting things up here, haven't you? T tell us about that. Yeah, so my favourite sighting up here has to be the gold crest. So I was waiting, I'd come as an actual member of the public rather than coming on one of the days we visited as the organisation. Yeah. And I was waiting for my opportunity to come through the, the hedges at the front there and there was a little gold crest who hopped out of the hedge and was hopping around on, on this gravel and it was just so special to watch it quietly getting on with business, ignoring this group of people who were congregating to go on a tour of the, of the viaduct. It was just really lovely. Oh, that's a real um, treat, isn't it? And yeah. a gold crest, I find, they're, they're our smallest bird. 
and they can be quite, uh, I think the, the technical term is confiding, because you can get quite close <laughs> to them. You can, you? yes. I mean, it, it was literally as far away as you are, just watching it do its business. It was completely unconcerned about us being there. Um, but yes, being the botanist, this, this morning I'm going to be spending my time looking at the wild plants that have sowed themselves into the, the railway ballast up yeah. at the front end of the yeah. viaduct. So I've already seen a wild strawberry this yes. morning, so that's quite exciting. So it's a botanist <laughs> paradise it up is, here, isn't absolutely. it? It is, absolutely. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you for coming in. It's a pleasure. <laughs> and we will put that uh, website address up in our YouTube chat so you can click the link and find out a little bit more. Now we're going to go over to uh, RSPB Ambassador David Dominey now. He's a broadcaster and chartered horticulturist and he's going to talk a little bit about growing wildflowers in a kind of a meadow setting. I mean just take a look at this. Look at the beauty and how many different coloured flowers and textures and shapes they're in. It really is gorgeous and the bees are absolutely loving it too. This is my little wildflower mound that I've grown. I put the seeds down early in the year and I just wanted to show you how much it's thriving. There are so many fantastic plants that are in bloom, such a mix of colours and textures just all in one space. This specific wildflower mix contains 25% native annuals, 25% perennials and 50% low maintenance grasses that could be left to grow without any maintenance. All it needs is a cut in late summer or in autumn. The seeds can be sown in spring or autumn. Then in the first year, you see masses of colourful displays of poppies, cornflowers, chamomile, marigolds, corn cockles. While the slower growing perennials, and these are wildflowers, they really do get established. In year two, many of the perennials will be mature enough for flowering and others will follow in subsequent years. If the grasses start to dominate, maintenance cuts can be carried out and this controls the vigour. Doing this you might lose a few flowering heads of the wildflowers but if carried out in spring these additional cuts will benefit the overall display. And always collect the clippings, don't let it fall onto the soil, break down and create more food so the grasses start to grow vigorously again. Always take them away and put them in the compost heap. Not only do these areas look stunning, but they also attract a whole host of wildlife. And once flowering, you'll see and hear the bees and butterflies playing as they visit your wildflower mound. Over time, you'll see birds and maybe bats too. Positioning the wildflower meadow near water also means you might spot a few dragonflies and damselflies as well. There's so much to gain from having wildflowers in your garden, whether it's a large area or even a small area. They don't take a lot of work to create and maintain. Making a mini meadow in the garden is probably my favourite thing to do. I just got so into it over lockdown, actually. Do you have a... I'm guessing you have a mini meadow as well, Adrian. I do, and it's my favourite thing until I plant up a flower board and then that's my favourite thing, <laughs> until I plant a tree when that's my favourite okay. thing. Okay. <laughs> and the reason why we're talking so much about plants today is that they're the, the bedrock yes. of a healthy ecosystem in, in the garden. Sure. Diversity of plants equals diversity of wildlife. Uh, and that's why we're encouraging so many people to get out there and plant this wild weekender. Yeah, and it's so fun to do as well. And I hope you've all got weather like this, because um, if you do, please get out into your garden after you've finished watching this, of course. So I thought what we'd do now yeah. is look at how choosing the right plant for the right place is an important part of that yes. process of location, growing the right Location, plants. location, location. <laughs> we all know that when we're choosing our own homes, but it's just as important in the garden, isn't it? Absolutely. But it's really quite simple. So I'm going to do three little pairings of things to think about when you're planting. And the first one is really important, and that's sun and shade. Okay. And how that some plants love to be bathed in sunlight just as we are, and some like to like hide themselves away okay. in shade little corners. So I've got some um, plants here to, to illustrate that. And I'm going to start with this one, actually. So this is catmint. Um, does it smell? Can I have a it little? It does. It does. Have, have a little. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice. This is an absolute sun lover. So if you put this in a shady place, it would, it would feel really sorry for itself. Mm -hmm. It might keep going. It might go a bit leggy. But what it wants is to be really baked out there. And then it will flower its heart off, and the pollinators will love it. Whereas over there, you have got a hookah. If you could pass me the here. one. Over the this far one? side, yes. Um, so, this is um, a, a woodland plant by origin. Obviously, the plants that we've got here now uh, at the tail end of April are still in their growing phase, but you can see the flower stalks already coming up. 
They're great for pollinators. What are they going to look like when they flower? Uh, these are uh, little spikes with little, uh, often red or pink or white flowers on the top of them, but bumblebees love it. And in fact, we've got some hookahs behind here to show. Oh, wow, there yeah. we are then. <laughs> They've been grown for all sorts of foliage oh, shades. Oh, yes, look, I can see the here it same comes. thing coming out. Yeah. Um, but a shade lover, so if you pop that in a sunny position, it would bake and it would feel really rather sorry for okay. itself. We might have to give this some shade then. <laughs> I, I'm doing quite well here yeah. with this. So there we go, sun and shade is, is the first one. Right. And you'll always find the labels tell you a lot about of where Of course, to put always it. read the labels, indeed. So I'm going to do the next thing, which is wet or dry, and whether a plant likes its feet in a kind of moist soil mm -hmm. or whether it likes a sandy soil mm -hmm. and you'll be able to choose from your garden exactly how that that is if you can take a handful of the soil and clump it together and it creates a a, a kind of ball a clay ball yeah. then you know you've got quite a, a wet soil and we've got here i love this one this is such a gorgeous color yeah. isn't it and this will come into multiple heads oh yes there's another this. one coming along you can probably recognise it. it looks a bit thistly. It does look thistly, but it's not spiky. It's not. I'm, I'm happy to stroke this. <laughs> this, by its scientific name, and you might find it in, in the garden centres, is Circium rivulari. Oh. But I like to call it by simple names. So this is the brook thistle, which gives an immediate <gasps> impression of what it likes. We've got a it, clue there. I like it. And we always talk about the roots as their feet. Mm -hmm. It likes its feet in water. Likes a paddle? Uh, not in a pond, but in, in <laughs> damp soil. Okay. And then you'll get these fabulous flower heads from it. Whereas the big plant that you've got over there... Shall I pass it? Yeah, lovely. Wow. So, this likes a dry soil. Uh, I used to know this as sedum. They've gone and renamed it as Hylotelephium. Oh, it's um, not quite as catchy, that, is it? It isn't, <laughs> is it? This is one of the very best butterfly plants but it likes to be in dry soil. If it's in wet, if it's in fertile soil, it'll grow leggy, it'll flop, it'll have a gap in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. It creates these uh, pink or reddish um, heads of flowers and things like red admirals and peacocks and small tortoise shell butterflies flock to it. But yes, a nice dry soil for that. And our final little pairing that I thought I'd talk about is whether you put these plants in a flower border, where they've got space to expand mm -hmm. and express themselves, or whether you can put them into the mini meadows that you're talking about. Yep. And those that we've seen here wouldn't cope within a mini meadow situation. No, they don't seem like meadowy plants to no, me. No, no. Okay. Um, and there are certain types of plants that really can cope with being with all the grasses around them, with all that competition, but can still thrive. And often the way to grow them is as plug plants. I love these. They're so cute. Some of them come quite big. Some of them come quite tiny. I'm going to show this to our, our little close-up camera. See how small that is when you get the plug plant in. Um, now, this one is a plant called betony. It's a, a native woodland plant, but can cope quite well in open, sunny positions. And what you do is you just create a small hole in your pop-up meadow, in your <laughs> mini meadow lawn, in your lawn run wild. Drop it in, and that should cope quite well. And this is a fabulous one doesn't look like much now but it's called nettle leaved bell flower and will grow to about 18 inches two foot tall wow. with purple bells all over that it. Sounds nice. So there we go I, uh, as a simple set of three rules to think about sun or shade wet or dry border or mini meadow and, and if you do that then you're putting the plant in the right place. Wonderful well that was very clear and very instructive thank you I've learned something. Um, well another place to think about when you're gardening is of course your walls and fences, because on their own, they're a bit boring, aren't they? So, um, yeah, consider climbers. We're going to watch a little video now about how to make the best of those vertical spaces. Growing climbing plants is a brilliant and beautiful way of bringing life to your dead vertical surfaces and can benefit the garden wildlife. Select your spot and identify what conditions you're working with. As with all gardening, choose the right plant for the right location. If you have a support like a trellis, choose something like a wisteria or a climbing rose that can be tied to the framework. Wisteria is like sunny positions and climbing roses like sun or partial shade and are best suited to house walls. A self-clinging climber like Boston Ivy is suited to north and east facing walls. Beware of ivy and the damage its aerial roots can do to brickwork should you ever need to remove them. For your garden fence, we recommend common jasmine or a passion flower. For a pergola, clematis climbers tend to be excellent for pollinators. Honeysuckles are also a great option because of their beautiful flowers that offer nectar to long-tongued moths plus berries for the birds. If you're planting in a pot, it will need lots of water. 
Use as large a pot as you can. Your plant will be happier and need less watering. Make sure there is good drainage. Put some broken bits of pot in the bottom and use a good peat-free compost. Some climbers will need pruning. Wisteria, for example, needs two prunes a year. It will take a little while for your climber to become large enough to be good for wildlife. The first thing you'll probably notice is when your climber starts to flower and begins to attract bees. In the longer term, as your climber thickens up, it will provide a place for birds to roost and nest. Hello, wasn't that wonderful? And I'm rather partial to the odd tangle of ivy, which is great for all sorts of species. Um, for birds nesting, it's a nice secure place to go. For birds who want some berries in the winter, they, you get those blackberries. And also for pollinators, late in the season, it's one of those last flowering plants that helps out pollinators as the weather's getting cooler. Now, just a reminder of what we're doing, Wild Weekender. From 28th of April to the 1st of May, we're bringing people together to sow, grow and create thriving habitats for nature on our doorsteps. You don't have to have a garden, you can have a pot, you can have a balcony, you can have a window box. And think about it this way, if you just have one flower, just one plot with one flower, that could be an absolute lifeline to a bumblebee that's exhausted, that's wandering down a grey street looking for food. And you can make all the difference to that, that insect and to other insects in your area. So the more you have, obviously, the more you'll do. And think about growing with your community as well. We've talked a lot about community this morning. We have a free downloadable guide um, and we'll put the link in the YouTube chat. That's our Wild Weekender guide and that's got all sorts of advice in there, including a list of some of the plants that Jenny and Adrian have been talking about. Do remember to share your photos of your wild space, your wild planting photos across the weekend using the hashtag MyWildSpace. Coming up in the next hour, story time, ideas for families, all sorts of other things coming up. And we're going to get to know the plants now with Jenny and Adrian. Yes, we are indeed. Um, and I'm going to kick us off with our first plant fact of this section. And that is the word primrose. You've probably seen them. Um, they are the first flower to flower, really. And that name, Prima Rosa, it actually means first flower of spring. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, it is. I yeah. believe Adrian has a lot more of these fantastic little flower uh, knowledge nuggets for us. And what I've done is I've homed in. Uh, we put within the Wild Weekend a pack uh, a list of plants that you might like to seek out. Now, I don't want people to be constrained by that list, but I thought no? it was to, good to give uh, an idea of some plants that we know are brilliant for wildlife. And there's a, there is a big list out there. But yes, I've brought some of them along here today. And the thing about knowing some extra facts about them. I love my wildlife, I love the creatures, but plants are, are wildlife too in their own way, and knowing a bit more about them gives them a character. Sure. Uh, and, and makes them personalities that you yeah, greet yeah. out in the garden. So I'm gonna start with, with this one. Uh, this is geranium, and people will probably know the, the name yes, geranium, yep. but do you know where the word geranium comes from? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so it comes from the Latin geranos, which is the word for crane. As in the bird? We immediately, yeah, rather, rather than a piece of machinery. Yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. Uh, so this um, is a plant that has a bird association. So is it eaten by cranes? What was the yeah. link there? The thing is that when this flowers, and look at that fabulous flower that we've got on screen at the moment, this is what this is going to grow into, and Beautiful. will flower for months on end with bumblebees coming in. And as those flowers go over, they create a, a, a seed ejecting mechanism that has a long spike to it. It's amazing, it sticks way out, and then each of the seeds is held on a catapult. And, and this projection catapults those seeds across the garden. Amazing. And that spike is like a crane's bill. And that's the English name for geranium. Well, Crane's there we bill. go. That's fantastic. I love that. I love that. Um, what else have you got for me? This one. Now, this isn't uh, a native plant. This one comes from America, actually, and it's called helenium. Uh -huh. Again, with all of these um, uh, Latin scientific names, I struggle to remember them, so I don't expect anybody else to. Helenium. But I do when I've got Helen the Helenium here. This is named from Greek mythology, Helen, Helen of Troy. Indeed. The yes. plant that launched a thousand gardeners, <laughs> perhaps. One for the classicists. Ah, that's a nice little twist on it. It's thought, now in Greek mythology, Helen was abducted by Paris. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, there's a plant called Herb Paris, but we won't dwell on that for now. Do they, can you plant them close together or best not to? Who best knows? not to. Oh, right. <laughs> Helen likes a sunny position. 
Paris likes a shady oh, position. Oh, well, there we are. Back Gosh, there's so done. many layers to this. And the, the theory is that this plant sprung up where Helen's tears fell on the soil when she was abducted wow. by Paris. And suddenly, Helenium has got a whole other face to it. Gosh. Now, this one. I recognise that. That looks familiar. What do you think? It's furry. Yeah. Is it something that my mum calls lamb's lugs? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if your mum comes in a place where your ears are called lugs, that's <laughs> yeah. absolutely it. This is lamb's ear. Now, again, this isn't a UK native, but is a native of um, uh, the southeast Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And the reason I picked this out is um, uh, it's used in particular by a solitary bee species. We're linking back, back to, to our the bees. earlier yep. session. One of our most I think charismatic solitary bees is called the wool carder bee. Yes. And if you plant this, you have got an absolutely brilliant chance of wool carder bees finding it. Why do they love it? Well, there's a flower spike that comes up to about 18 inches, 30 centimetres, 45 centimetres or so, which has got little whorls of pink flowers and the bees love drinking nectar from it. Yeah. But the female bees, the queen wool carder bee, goes to the leaf and cards which is the old word for comb, she combs the fluff off the leaves no. to create the nesting material in, in which she uh, lays her eggs and provisions it with, with nectar. So she makes a little nest with this fluff? She does. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. She combs off the fluff. And what you'll see is the males will find this plant and they'll sit on guard on a leaf knowing that the females will be coming to look for their nesting material. Do you know, uh, there's so much going on in your garden that you just wouldn't know about. That's just incredible. And if you haven't got this, then you probably won't see the wool carder bees yeah. doing exactly that. But plant this and suddenly this whole new world opens up. <laughs> cool, I'm going to get some of that, definitely. <laughs> I'm coming back to a British native here. Mm -hmm. This is foxglove. Yes. Uh, common foxglove. And I love the fact that one of the big theories is that this is nothing to do with foxes at all. This is to do with folksglove. Oh, uh, okay. And do you know yeah. who the folks were? Are they the sort of fairies at the bottom of the garden? They are indeed, ah. because you weren't meant to use the word fairy, so you talked about them oh as no. the little folk. Am I going to get bad luck now? <laughs> uh, I think you're going to be fine, because <laughs> you're doing great things for nature, and, and the little oh, folk good. love you doing that. Oh, good, thanks. We'll get this great flower spike up to about a metre tall, yeah. with all of the bells all up it that you, you tend to get from, from a foxglove. But you'll always see that the foxglove bends over at the tip mm -hmm. uh, and even on a windless day that tip of the foxglove will gently move about and what that shows is that the fairy folk are passing by and the foxglove is nodding Aww. in appreciation as they go by. Wow there we are. And of course brilliant, brilliant for bees, yes. fabulous plant for I've got for so bees. many videos on my phone of trying to get a, a shot of a bee coming out of a foxglove because it's just so satisfying. It? Yeah sometimes hey. and the sort of sound as they sort of buzz within that sort of echoey chamber it's really yeah. nice. Our final plant, yep. we haven't got here today, but I think we've got some pictures of it, okay. of mullein. And it's another one oh, yes, where it's a bit like lamb's ear, that if you plant it, you're almost certain to get a particular creature come in and use it. And that is the well-named mullein moth, using the mullein <laughs> plant. Makes sense. Look oh, at wow. that caterpillar. Isn't That's that absolutely gorgeous. fantastic? Uh, the moth itself, not quite as colourful. There, there it is. I think it's still got oh, a, a yeah. certain charm to it. It uh, looks that, a bit twig-like. I suppose that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. That's the evolution for it. So a mullein, it grows a massive flower spike with yellow flowers all over it. Great for pollinators. Called Aaron's Rod, which is a reference through to, to the Bible. And Aaron's Rod that he planted oh. firmly okay. in the ground. So you've got all of that fact going on around it. And then the wildlife that comes in and uses it. And I, I love how all of those connections come together. It's the plants, the wildlife, the folklore, all in one. I love it too. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much, Adrian. Well, I hope you're all sitting comfortably at home because it's story time. We have got a wonderful, wonderful reading coming up from WWW, <laughs> WWF Ambassador Miranda Richardson. She's going to read a lovely story for us called Omar, the Bees and Me. Hello, I'm Miranda Richardson. You might know me as an actor, but I'm also a WWF ambassador and a nature lover. I'm here in my garden in London, which I love making as nature friendly as possible. I love growing wildflowers for pollinating insects like bees. And I also have a pond with some fish. I'm thrilled to be here as part of the Wild Weekender with WWF 
RSPB and the National Trust to read you an extract from a wonderful book called Omar the Bees and Me. It's a story about bees and friendship. It's written by Helen Mortimer and the pictures are by Katie Cottle. Bees feed from flowers. It's called foraging. They love the sugary liquid called nectar. We can make bee corridors by planting flowers for bees and other insects to feed on. There would be no fruit or seeds for us to eat without bees. It all started when Omar brought a small slice of his mum's special honey cake for show and tell. Omar was new in our class. My grandpa used to keep bees, he said quietly. He had apricot trees and jasmine bushes in his sunny garden, a long way away. It gave Mr Ellery Jones a fun idea. He always has lots of fun ideas. We made apricot blossom out of pink tissue, all scrunched up, and cut white paper stars for jasmine flowers. It was the first time I saw Omar smile. Then we stuck them up and down the corridor outside our classroom. It's a bee corridor now, laughed Mr Ellery Jones. We pretended to be like little bees, buzzing from flower to flower. I smiled at Omar. Mr Ellery Jones told us all about how important bees are and that we should make our world more bee friendly by growing flowers for them to feed on. But where are the bees? asked Kurt. And the flowers, said Nish. Sometimes it is only the queen bee that stays alive over winter, said Mr Ellery Jones. And some bees hibernate, but there will be bees again in the spring when it's warm enough for the flowers to come out. At playtime, I sat by the bins in the corner of the playground, watching the lorries on the road and the noisy building site. Everything was grey. It gave me, my name's Maisie by the way, an idea. We should make a real bee corridor, I said all the way from our school to the park next to my granddad's garden. Mr Ellery Jones agreed it was a great idea. The next day, we chose some wildflower seeds, the kinds that bees love. Sylvie helped Mr Ellery Jones to fill out the order. We shook them into envelopes and wrote out the instructions. Please plant these seeds in a pot and put them on your windowsill. Water them when the soil is getting dry. Thank you from class one. The next day, we delivered the envelopes to everyone in town, from our school all the way to the park. We did a lot of walking, but some grown-ups came to help out and Mr Ellery Jones's husband brought snacks. Mr Ellery Jones explained that it would take some time for the flowers to grow, at least until next year. It seemed such a long time to wait. Every day we wondered how our seeds were doing. Mr Ellery Jones kept us busy with stuff. Omar and me got the best parts in the Christmas show. We were both bees. Then in the spring, the magic started. Every day when me and Omar walked home together, we saw more and more green spikes in tubs on the windowsills. Soon, the spikes sprouted some leaves. Things didn't look so grey. Then, it was summer and suddenly there were wildflowers. There were poppies and cornflowers and foxgloves all the way from our school to the park. By the time the holidays came, me and Omar were best friends. My dad called us Moma, which he said was short for Maisie and Omar because we did everything together. 
Most days we went to the park and then helped Grandad in his garden. All his flowers seemed to fizz while the bees buzzed in and out of them. I just can't believe how many bees there are this year, said Grandad. That's because of Omar, I said. And Mr Ellery Jones. And the bee corridor, said Omar. And we both started to buzz like bees, which made Grandad laugh. We need to look after our bees. Bees are found all over the world. I hope you enjoyed the story. Maybe there's a way you can help bees too. There's a real sense of hope in that story and a reminder of why we're doing all this really, to hand over a better, greener future to the next generation. Um, well, I'm here still with Adrian and he assures me he's going to be making something marvellous with some loo rolls and a sheet of newspaper. It wasn't a promise, it was a hope. Let's see how well we get on. <laughs> okay. So the reason for this is we're obviously saying to folk, go and grow something and often that growing process starts with a pot. Yep. And this is about it doesn't have to be a plant pot bought fresh, clean, new. Yeah. We don't want that, do we? You can use something around the house. Yeah. Okay. I've just bought a, a range of stuff which make perfectly feasible plant pots. An old coffee cup, an old tin, hmm. toilet tubes, yoghurt pots, or what was that, strawberry pot or something like that. All of those are perfectly usable yep. as plant pots. Critical thing is that they need drainage holes in them. Okay, so we've got the drill out again. Not for these. No. <laughs> they come with a ready hole in them. You obviously need a, a pot to put them into, but for, for things that have a long root run, like a sweet pea. Yes, I've used those for sweet peas. Successfully? Yeah, yeah, very successfully. And then you just plant them straight in the ground. Absolutely, because the cardboard then disintegrates yeah. within in the ground and you don't have to like tip them out of the pot and disturb the root, which is excellent for them. But on all of these, you'd need to bodge a hole, drill a hole in them mm -hmm. in, in order to make them usable. Because what you don't want, this thing about their feet, they don't want their feet sat in water yeah, all the time. Okay. In terms of recycling, of course, when you then label, because you want to know what you've planted in yeah, there. Yeah, I sometimes once, forget to do that. <laughs> once you pop the seed in, you've got no idea what that Ooh. is. So um, lollipop sticks, perfect. Again, they'll disintegrate over time, but that's fine. That, that's part of decomposition for you. But I thought I'd try something live. This could go terribly, okay, terribly well, here wrong. here we go. Fingers and I crossed. Thought, let's try and make an origami pot for you okay. live. Oh, ambitious, I like it. What you need is a sheet of newspaper. And I've cut this down to size already because what it needs to be is twice as long as it is wide. So that's uh -huh. the first thing you need to do. You need to get this two by one. And if you do it across the centre fold, nice and easy. Are you ready for this? Now? Yeah, take okay. it away. So We should time him, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Add some extra pressure. I like to do this on a flat surface. I'm going to struggle a little bit with these, um, with these bars here. But first fold over, fold it in half. Then you fold it in half again and create a nice crease and open that fold back up. Okay. Now what you want is the, the flappy ends in front of you yep. here towards you. Paper aeroplane time. Over it goes. Over it goes, paper aeroplane, and then you take one of the flaps and come up to the middle, and that flap then up again. Now it looks like a little hat or a boat. Little hat or a boat. Mm -hmm. I like it as a boat. Little boat on the ocean. <laughs> this is the only twist that you're going to do, and it's left to right, turn it over. Oh. Now we bring in the sides of the boat, or the hat for you, <laughs> into the middle, and then we once again bring from the bottom up to the middle, and then up again. And this is the only tricky part of the, the manoeuvre in that your flappy bit as you've brought that up now needs to tuck in behind here. This is the technical part. Yeah, this is where you give me 10 minutes to do it. <laughs> oh no, you that's alright. In, tucking the edges into it. Looking good so far. Sure. Now we need to do just a couple of little manoeuvres to create some folds. So we bring the tip down to the middle mm -hmm. and done. And then the, the weird one is that we pull that tip over to that side and we create just a little crease there, and I you'll see. see why immediately. Doesn't look like much at the moment, but now oh. you can open it up. Hello. This thing with a fold that you've created flops over. Ah, yes, okay. Magic. Oh, well, that's pretty think? good, isn't it? You've been practicing that, Adrian. Beautiful. But uh, and you can get to the point where you can make one of those in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Ready-made plant pot. And just like your toilet tube, once you've planted something in it, that can go in the ground and yeah. you don't need to disturb the roots. Nice and simple. Again. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, well, 
I mean, yeah, we were practicing this yesterday, and oh, I, mean, I don't know if they're any good, but I did have a little go. No. And, uh, oh, well, I don't know what you think, but I managed to do four in. No, I'm joking. You okay. did these earlier. I did, I did indeed. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, they, they create instant plant pots from something that was going to go in the garbage. Yeah, love it. Reuse, recycle, all of that right here today. And you got some origami to boot as well. Yeah, quite fun to do with the kids as well. Fantastic, great stuff. Well, thanks very much. Um, we are now going to find out about growing vegetable seeds because now is a great time to do that. Um, so here's Gonzalo Taylor from WWF's Eat for Change project to tell us all about it. Hello and welcome again to the Wild Weekender. My name is Gonzalo and I'm a campaign manager at WWF UK. And this session is all about how you can grow your own food. As part of our Eat for Change campaign, we encourage people to learn more about food and tell you how you can make more sustainable choices that help benefit the environment. Today, I wanna to talk to you about three different sustainable foods you can easily grow at home. Growing your own food is such a great way to promote sustainability and even reduce your own grocery bill. So here are three foods to consider. Number one, if you do not have a garden, why not grow your own herbs? Herbs such as basil, mint, rosemary, they're easy to grow from any windowsill. Growing your own herbs can help save money on expensive bought herbs, which can often come in a lot of plastic packaging. Plus, fresh herbs taste better and are better for the environment. To grow herbs, all you need is a pot, some soil and seeds. Simply fill the pot with soil, sprinkle some seeds on top and cover it lightly with soil. Water your soil regularly and you will have fresh herbs in a matter of days. Now, food item number two, leafy greens. I'm talking lettuce, I'm talking spinach, kale and um, arugula, arugula, <laughs> the one that's difficult to pronounce. Um, if you've got garden space, they're a fantastic option for anyone that wants to start growing their own food. Um, growing your own leafy greens is a really great way to reduce food waste and giving you access to fresh greens on hand whenever you need them. So to grow leafy greens, all you need is a pot, some soil and seeds. It's as simple as that. Fill the pot with soil. Once again, sprinkle the, sprinkle the seeds lightly on top and then cover them quite lightly with soil. Then remember to water your soil regularly and you will have fresh leafy greens in just a matter of weeks. Finally, number three, everyone's favorite, tomatoes. If you're ready for a slightly more ambitious challenge than the last two, this is a great food to try. Tomatoes are a great source of vitamin C, fiber, potassium, and they're still easy to grow. To grow tomatoes, all you need is a pot, some soil, and some tomato seeds or seedlings. Doesn't matter which ones you get, just get some seedlings. Um, fill the pot with soil, plant the seeds about two inches deep. These ones have to go in a bit deeper. Remember to water your soil regularly and you will have some fresh tomatoes in just a matter of months, right in time for the summer season, right in time with spring and all the beautiful flowers coming out. So yeah. So to wrap up, growing your own food is just a great way to live sustainably and save money. By making small changes to our food choices, we can actually make a pretty big impact on the environment and our wallets. So thank you for listening. I hope you give it a try and remember to eat for change. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Gonzalo. And I love to grow rocket. I, I eat it, but also sometimes I let it bolt because I love the delicious honey scent of the flowers. And so do the pollinators. I often see hoverflies around my rocket that's, that's bolted. Um, so yeah, really good plant, a good all-rounder all there to grow. Now we've got some more photos that have been sent in by people who are creating their own spaces for nature and going wild in their local area. Uh, this is from Claire Marshall. Now Claire says, I will be planting up my knapweed seedlings in amongst the allium bulbs planted in the autumn. Pleased to see loads of love in the mist, yarrow, borage and wild carrot coming back from last year's seeds. Following Royal Horticultural Society advice, I'm training my clematis horizontally to encourage more flowers. From two years ago, I've been gradually removing daffodils and tulips, swapping them for bulbs that do help pollinators. 
Three years in, trying to attract solitary bees and my rose and pyrocanthus both show the circular cut of leaf cutter bees. We've got six tubes filled in year one, 25 in year two, and now waiting for about 50 to emerge. New deluxe bug hotel waiting for them. Well done, Claire, and thank you very, very much for sending those in. Um, brilliant bug hotel there. Now, you may know uh, RSPB and WWF ambassador Megan McCubbin for her work on TV and as an author. She, she's obviously uh, on the watches, spring watch, uh, winter watch, etc. And she has also been doing a little bit of filming for us. She visited a nature friendly school where the children are making wildlife welcome. Today I'm on the grounds of Bitten Park Primary School where the students and staff are just as excited as me about all the wildlife on their doorstep, which we've all learnt about with the new BBC series Wild Isles. From the wildest parts of the UK to the hearts of our cities, there's so much habitat to explore and so many species to meet. But if there's one thing we've learned from this series, it's that wildlife is in trouble and it needs a helping hand because one in seven of our native species are at risk of disappearing forever. One in four of our native mammal species are now threatened. These include things like our favourite species, hedgehogs, otters, dormice and bats. And it's because our landscape has become a lot less wild. It's become fragmented with building roads, expanding our towns and cities, and it's bad for all of us. We need nature. Nature helps us because it protects us from droughts and flooding. It helps us with climate change and it also helps us to grow our food. We can't survive without it and we don't have to. We can survive and coexist with nature side by side. With a bit of time, tolerance and space, nature can thrive in our cities and towns. It can thrive in nature friendly farms and of course it can thrive within our schools too. No matter the size of your school ground, there is always something you can do to get nature in. But it just needs a bit of an invitation. It needs a way to move in. It needs shelter, water and food. So the wilder you make the habitats around your school, the more species you are bound to see. And by providing that safe space for nature, you're not only making your school wilder, but you're helping your local community and environment too. And there's so many different ways of doing it. You can make a small wildlife pond for things like newts to come safely and lay their eggs. You can put up bird boxes to allow birds to come in for the breeding season. You can make wild flower meadows for pollinators. Every little thing counts. And I know from personal experience that being in a wilder environment helps so much. It makes us feel better, we learn better, and we work together more effectively. So what have we got to lose? No matter what size your school ground is, there is always something we can do to make wildlife a home. Imagine if every single school did everything they could for habitats for wildlife. Our wildlife would be a lot safer and we would be better for it too. So schools across England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland are being asked to take part in Schools for Nature. A celebration about the wildlife we have and all the ways we can help to save them. This June, we're asking schools to open their gates and to invite their community inside to learn all about the wildlife that's living there and to show how the school is lending it a helping hand. This could create massive ripples of change. This could help businesses, public spaces, the entire community, the gardens, all make a difference for wildlife. It's what would make our environment a healthier, safer place. So join me and the staff and students here at Bitten Park Primary School to make the school grounds a wilder space and to allow school community members to live a wilder life. Let's make every school a school for nature. It's a really important message there actually, that nature isn't just there to be pretty, it's actually essential to our lives. Um, and I love that the school is inviting people to see what they've done as well and I think that's also really important. We've got to shout about what we're doing in the hope that that will inspire other people. Um, so please share what you're doing, um, use that hashtag MyWildSpace and I mean 
together, you know, we've got quite a good chance of saving nature. We can't do it alone, but together, I think we've got a good chance. Um, well, speaking sort of of a collaborative effort, we've been uh, reading some of your fantastic questions. So thank you so much for sending those through. And I've got a few here, which I'm going to put to Adrian. So let me just grab my phone. Yeah, we've got quite a lot to get through, haven't we? We do actually, Fabulous. yeah, this is really great. So first up, this is Jenny Shepherd. No, this is Nicholas, I'm sorry. Um, he is asking, I have a dead tree in my garden. Can I drill that, like we did earlier, uh, to make a home for a solitary bee? Yes, you can. That, that is the easy answer. Okay. Uh, with a dead tree, it's quite likely, if it's sat in the garden, it's likely to have some wood boring beetles actually creating some of those holes for you. So have a look first to see if some of those holes are being created by other bits of nature. And you may find it's already being peppered with holes. That certainly happens in my garden. And that, that's what would happen in, in the wild. That's yeah. why we don't need to go drilling all the way through the countryside because nature's doing that for us. So check that. But if you think you need more holes, feel free. Drill away. And remember to go on that sunny side for your solitary bees. But you could, on that occasion, drill some in, in, the, um, in the opposite side, and that may attract other invertebrates that like a little bit of shade. Yeah. OK, great. Mm. Well, thanks very much. Uh, the next question is, how can I post photos of my wild spaces? Well, you can do that on social media. We'd love to see. Um, use that hashtag, uh, my wild space, and we'll see them. And hopefully other people will too. Uh, the next question is from Noreen, and she's asking, what can I do about spotted medic? When we left our grass to grow wild and didn't cut it, the plant took over. Okay, okay. Spotted medic. It's in the uh, trefoil family. It's related to the clovers. Uh, it's got a very attractive leaf with a spot on it and a little flower that is used by some pollinators. And this is the thing. When we say no mow may, for example, mm. don't mow your lawn, you'll find that there are some things that are in there already that grab their chance. Yes, I've had that happen with a bee orchid. Ah, it popped up oh, out wow. of nowhere. I was, yeah, really chuffed. <laughs> and in some people's gardens like Noreen's, you'll find that something in there suddenly dominates. Mm, okay. And what you often find in your lawn is it's on a fertile soil uh, and therefore things grow really quite vigorously. So one thing you can do, Noreen, is you can do more cuts in your first year. Always remove the clippings yes. off a no mo um, area of meadow because mm -hmm. you're reducing the fertility yeah. and allowing some of those more dainty delicate plants to survive. Yeah. What you can do is also add some plug plants that we were looking at earlier so you can introduce a bit of diversity in there but I think the critical thing is realizing that you haven't created an instant hay meadow of old. These things take time mm. to develop and over time you'll see other plants come in help some of them on their way and try and add diversity when you can. But recognise yeah. this is a bit of a journey and see how things go. Yeah. You know what I'd do? I'd do a bit of an experiment. I'd cut a bit of it, I'd introduce some plug pants to a bit of it, I'd leave a bit of it and see what happens. Yeah, it's a bit of trial and error gardening, I think, and yes. that's fine, that's yeah. absolutely fine. No right or wrong. Fantastic. Well, another experiment which you can tell us about is um, Lisa, she is asking what kind of grass do you need to plant for a wild meadow. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, so ideally, our hay meadows of old had got a whole range. Uh, some people, I, I think, imagine that there's one species of grass, but I, I think many of you will realise there are lots and lots of different species. And in those old hay meadows, you'd have sweet vernal grass and crested dog's tail, and you'd have um, a whole range of things. So what you can do is you can cut your lawn really close to, usually in, in autumn, mm -hmm. um, so you can actually see little bits of, of soil in it. Yeah. And then buy, and they're really cheap. Uh, RSPB has its own little, little mix of wildflower seed that contains native grasses, mixed native grasses, and scatter that over, again, to increase the diversity in your lawn. Mm. And just to give you confidence of what you can achieve out there, I got some bog standard turf rolls, which are nothing but your kind of perennial rye grasses, your kind of lawn grasses mm -hmm. that are cultivated. And I've turned that into a mini meadow that's now got about 45 plant species in it, oh. but without removing those lawn grasses to start with, but adding things over the top. Okay, well that's good to know. So mm. it can be done and relatively easily by yeah. the sound of it. And again, I'm not aiming for perfection, I'm just aiming for diversity. Nice, oh, that's a good sound bite. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Right, well the last question I'm going to ask is from Jenny from North Yorkshire. Well I'm also a Jenny from North Yorkshire, so hello. Um, she's asking, I only have a little space for a few pots. What's the best thing I could plant in them to help nature? Ah, okay. 
And, and the, the key thing here is we're not talking about big gardens today, unless you've got one. If you, if you have, then Fantastic. do everything you can to help nature. But whatever size of space you've got, you can genuinely help wildlife. Again, I'm going to turn back to the little session we did earlier about the right plant for the right place. Mm -hmm. So your little space might be a very shady one, in which case you need the things like the hookahers and you need the primroses, the yep. woodland type species. But if you've got a really sunny space, then you need those plants such as our hylotelephium uh, and our cat mint that are going to love that. Yeah. And they'll cope really well in pots. You need to have a little bit more TLC to, um, to look after them when they're in pots. But yeah, think about where, where your space faces and then choose plants that you like and that wildlife likes and you'll you'll have it buzzing in no time yeah and i think there's a list of plants um suggested plants probably many that you've mentioned in that downloadable pack so yeah have a check of your emails because you if you've signed up you should have received that and it'll have all that information and a few little starting points great stuff right well another thing which is really fun to grow is um, sunflowers. Oh yeah. And yeah, these yeah. are something I mean I really love. They're dead easy, they look joyous and pollinators love them too. So let's find out how to grow them. Planting sunflowers is a fun activity for the whole family and one of the easiest ways to provide food for birds in your garden. Feeding birds is a great way to help them through difficult times of year. You can sow the seeds directly into the ground in late April or early May but it's best to sow them in pots in late March or April to keep them safe from slugs and snails until they are planted out at about 30 centimetres tall. Fill a 7.5 centimetre pot or slightly larger with peat-free compost. Poke one seed per pot down into the compost. Cover with about one centimetre of compost and then water. Place in a warm position. Use a propagator lid if you have one. Or you can make your own mini cover to protect your plants by cutting the top off a fizzy drink bottle. Plant out in a sheltered position once the risk of frost has passed. Sunflowers like to grow in a rich soil. Protect them as best you can from slug and snail damage by using copper bands, broken eggshells or any other organic slug control methods. Well, that was lovely. And sunflowers are brilliant, aren't they? I always love trying to grow them each year and seeing how big they can grow. Perhaps if you want to have a go uh, this season, uh, let us know in a few months who got the highest. I mean, let, let's have a bit of a competition. Who will get the highest sunflower this year? Uh, great fun to grow those and really, really easy. Now, joining me is Crystal Batty from Face for Change. Welcome to Wild Weekend Alive. Thank you very much for coming along. Thanks very much. And uh, we're here in beautiful RS, uh, uh, National Trust, RSPB, what am I talking about? National Trust Castlefield Viaduct. It is stunning. It's like a nature reserve up in the sky, isn't it? Isn't it oh, beautiful? It's absolutely amazing. I am completely in awe. As soon as I walked in, it's just gorgeous. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about how plants make you feel. So briefly, can you tell us a little bit about your work with Face for Change. Yeah, so I'm a creative projects worker and um, so we basically provide um, workshops for the community that's needed and um, so it could be gardening, it could be um, food, it could be anything really but I um, grow food um, and gentle gardening with the community for Nature for Health really. Um, yeah. The idea of gentle gardening, <laughs> it's yeah. very calming. It is calming and I think that's the purpose of it really, it's just being in a space that's safe for everybody and you get to meet people it's lovely yeah and you do get a bit of exercise as well you do and your mental health is improved so let's talk about how planting and plants and that kind of activity affects your mental health how does it work well from my experience I started growing and collecting indoor plants and I've definitely seen an improvement in my own mental health and I've also seen an improvement in um, within the people that actually come to our workshops as well um, it's just about being present. It's almost like a meditative state, I would say. Um, you're, you, you feel calm um, and just being connected to nature and having a kind of connection with the soil. There's something in it. Yeah. You know, it makes me feel happy. Yeah. Um, and for some reason, I just want to keep going back and doing more and more. And it's nurturing as well. You're nurturing something. So you're seeing how yeah. it progresses. Yeah, and it's almost like a form of nurturing yourself. So it's just paying attention to those little details. We're so busy with our lifestyles that we completely forget sometimes to you know, stop and just take a moment and appreciate what's around us, and especially nature. 
and being mindful. So it's mindful, gentle planting. I love that. That, that sounds like it could re work really well for, for many of us. Yeah. So people, for people watching, what tips would you give? How can you go out there and start planting? What activities should you be doing to really boost your mental well-being? I think it really depends what you're after. Um, you could obviously have an obsession like I did with indoor plants, um, but maybe starting small, like growing some herbs um, on your balcony or on your windowsill, um, even you could do a mass, something massive if you wanted to yeah. outside. You could decide you want to have an allotment or, yeah, just growing food. I think the reward is really, really lovely. Oh, yeah. And, and something, I think, her, something about herbs, that they, they can be tactile, they can be aromatic. And exactly. you can really kind of immerse yourself in them. And we've been talking about growing things like basil and, and thyme and, and mint earlier on. So it's really, really lovely example. I'm going to ask, have you got a favourite houseplants? And do you kind of talk to them? How do you interact with them? How does it... um, so I do talk to all of my houseplants. Yeah. My favourite one has to be the Monstera Deliciosia, which is basically a Swiss cheese plant. It's oh, yeah. Just, yeah. It's yeah. huge and it just keeps growing and growing. Yeah. Um, but just cleaning them and like you yeah. said that nourishment yeah. you know it's really good for our mental health yeah um, and I, I'm, I'm in such a great position that I'm able to teach that to the community yeah um, and we also have like a young growers um, um, gardening workshop which is fantastic for them as yeah. well for the youth because it means that they can learn how to grow their own food and they get to harvest and take that yeah. home and that's just beautiful Wonderful. and but you see the change in them as well as they're developing I definitely think. and they get to meet new people and friends you know I mean we're based in Liverpool so um, some some students come from quite far you know just to participate within the universities <laughs> and colleges in Liverpool but they don't know anybody yeah. um, so it's really lovely to like interact <coughs> and like find you know find new friends and, yeah. and make new connections and I suppose one thing about doing an activity together to kind of boost your mental health and build that sense of community is that you're not having that kind of intense relationship where you're you know face to face you know analyzing each other you're working alongside each other aren't you yeah, and you're creating something together and it's teamwork and you're, yeah. you're, you're building, you know, it's lovely. And, and the reward that you get from growing food is, is kind of priceless. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's wonderful. We should, we should all be doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Thank Crystal. You. Thank you for coming. Now, talking about plants helping our health, we've got a lovely little film now with WWF ambassador and actor Kel Spellman and artist Kedar William Sterling. And they're going to be talking about how plants make them feel. Slightly bigger plants, trees, they're going to be meeting the ancient oaks of Sherwood Forest. I'd love that to be the entrance to my house. Yeah. It's huge! There's like holes in them, but yet they're still creating life. These trees could talk, pal. It's sort of like you're seeing the soul of the tree. Yeah, it's so nice being here in Orsham. Hello, my name is Kel Spellman. And I'm Kido William Sterling. And we are here today at Sherwood Forest on a journey to learn more about this precious, beautiful ancient woodland, and in particular, focus on our ancient oak trees, which of course we know are so, so special, but need our protection, because we heard, well, a pretty startling fact this morning. Indeed we did. The UK used to be covered in this beautiful ancient woodland, and now it only takes up about 2.5% of our wild isles. So we are on a journey to learn more about these forests. We're going to meet some local experts and of course we're going to find our way to connect more deeply with this precious, beautiful habitat. Maybe find some mushrooms. Yeah, mate. Yeah? Check out some fun guys. Because you're a fun guy. See you. Welcome to Sherwood, guys. Thank Hope you're having a nice morning. The best. So here at Sherwood, we've got about a thousand living ancient oak trees and that's one of the largest collections in Europe. So we're looking at between 400 and 600 years old wow. in most of the Sherwood ancients and veterans. Wow. Yeah, pretty old. So our ancient oaks, we think that they support about 2,300 species just themselves. Wow. So without them, you know, kind of everything else falls away. So the soil, the microbes in the soil and the invertebrates that are around these ancient oaks are just so, so important. The ancient oaks are really vulnerable in our kind of UK landscape. They're just so you know, important for everything. Without the insects, you're not going to have the mammals, the birds, everything else that falls in line with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is the major oak. He's about 1100 years old, we think. And I was reading the roots go out to where the picnic tables are. Yeah, yeah. So if you turned him upside down and expanded him, that's where his root system is absolutely vast. Phenomenal. You see these almost like kind of scaffolding structures. Yep. I'm guessing obviously that is that is just to help kind of support it yeah, really, yeah. yeah. 
What are some of the benefits to having a fully functioning forest, particularly made of, of ancient oaks? Well, compared to a kind of um, homogenous um, forestry plantation, for example, where everything's the same age and everything's the same species, you've got a huge diversity in the canopy. So you've got something like this, which has got a vast crown on it. It can act like a massive, massive sponge for carbon. So having that diversity all the way across the canopy in age and structure, not only does it have a benefit for the wildlife, for the species, but for, for climate change, it's absolutely yeah, 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 fundamental. Of it is, yeah. it's, it's so impressive, isn't it? It's phenomenal, mate. It's sort of overwhelming. I genuinely think that's the best tree I've seen. The size of it. I mean, all these, I think, are oak trees. That's the thing that struck me most. Mm. And also the cycle of them, how much they give after they kind of are on the way out, you know, the back exactly. end of their life. Exactly. So are we off to you now, Kel? We should be meeting Lucy, who's going to help us get to know the forest even better. So we're going to start our forest bathing experience. Now, the great thing for me about forest bathing is there are no rules and anyone can do it. When you look at the forest as a whole, with all of your senses, and really take that time to be mindful, that memory stays with you, the health benefits start to come through, and forest bathing has been proven to have so many health benefits. For me, my favorite part of it is to get laid down and really in there with the woodland. You'll notice the light changes, the breeze blow in, and see things from a whole different angle. Now, as we're lying still with our whole bodies really close to the ground, I'm just going to think about what's lying underneath us. The roots of the trees from behind us, the creatures crawling around under there, and all those little mushrooms waiting to pop. How do you guys feel about your trip to Sherwood Forest today? Quite special, really diverse, and it was it was really um, nice to see how we're taking care of these trees. It's not just left to their own devices. You know, it's a great example that we can actually we can preserve natural spaces rather than absolutely decimate them. But it's beautiful to be reminded of what is possible and what we can do. And we don't appreciate it enough. I think mm. what we have on our doorstep, and when you don't have that appreciation, you don't protect it enough. You know, when you hear that the UK is one of the most nature depleted places in Europe, it does shine a light on it in a different perspective. I think that distance from it when you don't connect with it as much. When you think about that, the major oak. A thousand odd years old, man. Oh, bro, we ain't got a thousand years. Yeah. That's the thing, you know. I mean, you said it right at the start, didn't you? Two and a half percent left. We've just got to try and hold on to them for as long as we can, really. But I think, you know, what will help is if people, people can come see and feel and see this for themselves. Taking the time out, coming here, spending some actual real time to take a step back, mm -hmm. forest bathing, going for a walk, it's reconnecting, realigning. Realigning, recentering, all of that. We can do it. Lost to share with you as well, brother. Yeah, man, you too, but always. That was lovely. I love a bit of forest bathing and being immersed in greenery, which, which is what we are here at National Trust Castlefield Viaduct. We hope you're enjoying Wild Weekend Alive so far and sharing your photos on social media with the hashtag MyWildSpace. Now, um, we are going to show you a mystery insect and we're going to give you a bit of time to ponder what it might be. And this is a, an insect that we often get sent pictures of. Um, to, people just don't understand what it is. It's a little fluffy thing with a spiky bit coming out of its face. Um, and we're going to tell you a little bit about what it is. There we are, up on the screen for you now. That is a mystery insect. So do have a think about that one. Answers in the YouTube chat, please. There's no prize, just the glory of knowing you got it right. Or close to being right, anyway. Don't worry if you don't know what it is. It's, I, I really like these. We'll talk about them a bit later. And in fact, I'm going to tell you what's coming up. So in the next hour or so, we have got so much going on. We've got more demos for you. We've got Tayshan Hayden-Smith joining us. We have got more of your photos. We've got more demos. Um, and we've got videos from uh, WWF's Director of Science, Mark Wright, with some great stuff on pollinators. Uh, there is so much more to come. 
But right now, we are going to take a break for 10 minutes so you can all have a little rest, go make a, go make a drink, and we'll see you all in about 10 minutes' time.
Hello, welcome back. Hope you had a good break. Now we've got some special guests coming up. Um, Community Integrated Care has teamed up with the National Trust, WWF and the RSPB to create a range of brilliant resources for people who draw on or deliver social care. It's all inspired by Wild Isles and it includes guides for sensory gardens, sensory walks for nature, games and activities. And you can take a look at communityintegratedcare.co.uk slash nature for more details. We'll put that link up in the YouTube chat. We're delighted to welcome Phil and Debbie from Community Integrated Care. We'll be talking to Sharon a little bit later on, but welcome Phil and Debbie. Welcome to Wild Weekender. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Now, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you do. So who wants to go first? Shall I go first, Phil? Yeah, yeah. go on. Yeah, um, Community Integrated Care is an organisation that is to, here to support people to learn, have independent lives. Um, we take them out and about the community, we try to get them to live the best life possible, get them involved in all sorts of activities and the wildlife and gardening one is a huge hit, especially with Phil because he loves going outside. Um, yeah, we just go out and do lots of things, lots of good things with people, teach them how to be independent. And what do you most enjoy about doing all this film? I love participants. Puff is just a shower. I call it. You like flowers? Yeah, I like flowers. Yeah. And sometimes not just flowers. Sometimes we do uh, what's called herbs. Herbs, so you're growing your own, are you growing your own food as well? Yeah, we've got our own food now. It's brilliant. What's your favourite thing to grow? Uh, it's sometimes, sometimes strawberries, sometimes. Um, Lovely. And um, well, I don't know what the other one's called. Tomato plants? Uh, tomato plants. Oh, very nice. You'll be fascinated to know this, <laughs> but I've spotted on this, on this viaduct, there's wild strawberries growing. Yes, you I might, did notice. You might see them as you have a wander them. around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love a yeah. strawberry. And um, what do you think, what's the... What do you get out of it? I mean, is it that kind of feeling of meeting other people, or is it that is it the actual plants themselves that you I'm love? Meeting other people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's meeting other people within the organisation. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. That well, sounds like a brilliant setup. Uh, yeah. There's choose, meet Tuesdays and Fridays, don't we? Yeah. So at the minute we're at Newton Community Garden Hospital. Yeah. And we um, just taken all the soil out from the plant that we got there, which was the World yeah. Cup, wasn't oh. it, Phil? Yeah, we're so that's, cob. <laughs> yeah. That's all empty now, ready to be filled. Yeah. And then yesterday we were taking all the herbs out yeah. of the planters. Yeah. So we got to take some of them home to put into our gardens. So yeah. you've got lots more work to do. Yeah. You're going to be busy, <laughs> both of you. <laughs> Loads of work there yeah. still to do. <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are busy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard work. Well, it can be hard work, not to say hard work, but it's fun, isn't it? And you, you get really get a sense of enjoyment out of doing this stuff. Yeah, we yeah, do. We can take it, then Phil can take it back home. Yeah, but we could get a t-shirt. Uh, yeah? You know the t-shirt? We, we could get a t-shirt. Yeah? You got special t-shirts? No, get free t-shirts. No, we're, we're going to get t-shirts, aren't we? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds absolutely amazing. We're going to talk to um, Sharon, who works with you as well. So yeah. we're going to go over to her now. She's in uh, the demo area with Adrian. And thank you very much, Phil and Debbie. Over to, thank you, and over to Sharon and Adrian. Jamie, yes, I'm joined by Sharon Rangasamy, who uh, operates as a, another facet of the Community <laughs> yeah. Integrated Care Programme. And for you, it's all about a community garden, isn't it? It is. So it could is. you explain to me a little bit about what happens there? Yeah, well, we get um, lots of beautiful people like Phil and the lovely carers like Debbie um, that bring all the service users over to the lovely garden that we've got um, in Newton Willows, which is a, behind a community hospital. It's like for day patients. Um, but there was a lot of money invested in a structure a couple of years ago from the Rugby League World Cup through Community Integrated Care to build um, a garden that some of the Community Integrated Care people could use. Um, obviously Covid hit and it was a really wonderful time to get people outside again mm. and together again. So there's, um, there's a massive structure in the garden, at the very back of the garden, it's lovely, and it's in the shape of the Rugby League World Cup, it's about so high. Oh wow. We, um, we fill it full of beautiful plants, we try and uh, have a bit of seasonal interest, we do a bit of colour interest, 
We've also got uh, a lot of planters lower down where um, we obviously it makes it a bit more accessible for some of our wheelchair users and our frame users. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we've got a, a whole area there where we've got a wildlife bed that we're, we're um, hoping to develop a bit more this year. Um, we had a tree from the Queen's Canopy brought in as well. So we've got a lovely oak that we're giving a bit of tender loving care for. Uh, for the Queenie um, and yeah we built a bug hotel this last year and everybody is just uh, yeah just really getting involved in different aspects and we grow things from seed as well we do indoor sessions um, so people are actively engaged with yes. with the gardening process yes and lots of it, it dips in and out obviously mm. it depends on which care team's involved whether people have got hospital appointments or whether they've got other things going on in their lives because they volunteer in lots of other places mm. Mm. and it is so it's so rewarding we have got so many so many people with different backgrounds and experience and needs and mm. uh, bringing them all together and just weaving through each other's lives and coming together just in the outdoors is wonderful and so I presume there's some social element to Very that that's much. going on. Very much. And then there's the value of being in nature. Is, is that a big part of it as well? Oh, huge, huge. I mean, only this week we were, um, we had, we've had decimation. It's been an awful week. We've had to completely empty our beds because we've had a vine weevil break out, which, which is quite awful because half of our plants have been eaten. But um, it's, we had a lot of hard graft and we pulled out all the bugs and some people are repelled by that but then we've got other, other, other people who are holding bugs in their hands and fascinated it's, it, it, it absolutely fascinated mm. and we just put them out for the birds and we've watched the birds come and eat them and you know the robin is our gardener's best friend and we've found that out just first hand it's just lovely mm. and we're all sharing in that and uh, yeah we just hope to hope to keep going and just bring more nature in by making the wildlife beds um, and the uh, we've got wildlife meadow that we're hoping to really develop this year to bring the pollinators in um, and just make it something for not just we're tending to it and our community integrated care are tending to this lovely uh, garden but it's to be used by the doctors and the nurses and the patients uh, okay. of this hospital as well so it's holistic the, the oh, value absolutely that comes yes yes so we're working on some sensory beds as well at the moment because um, there is an area that we've used quite a lot for um, presentations and get-togethers mm. and um, we've got these lovely beds where we've, we're going to put herbs and, and pollinating plants and things that we can use as edibles um, so we're working on that at the moment and mm -hmm. hopefully it'll bring a bit of colour and it'll catch people's eye and they'll come out and enjoy that just like you say the holistic side of it and it's just so enjoyable it's really, really enjoyable. And the starting point for the garden, was it a, a kind of abandoned plot that you started with? Do you know, I wasn't involved right from the start. Okay. I only came on board last year. So okay. it's, it was a year in, the, in, um, in developing and I think it was, it was just a matter of, let's try. Yeah. And then we're just trying a bit harder and yeah. we're just seeing what works, what doesn't work, seeing who wants to get involved, who doesn't. And it's, it's brought some wonderful people together. It really has. So the future looks bright for it, because oh. I think that, that for me, the thing that this exemplifies is how the, the, a garden is a place where you can have the social side of things, mm -hmm. you can have all the sensory and health benefits, mm -hmm. and you can have wildlife all combined into one mm -hmm. and all helping each other. Yeah, the carers really, they're, they're, they're brilliant because they, they bring another element to it, they bring their enthusiasm to get involved in the garden, and then they all say, oh, I feel better for coming out today, even if it's half an hour and we get rained off. Mm. They're like, I'm so glad we did it. Um, we're just all outdoors freezing cold and then we'll go for a cup of coffee somewhere in a garden centre and you know it doesn't matter but you just feel mentally better yes being together and being outdoors it's wonderful it's fun that sounds absolutely wonderful this is over towards Warrington isn't yes it, isn't it is it? it is and the fact that you mentioned pollinators is a really good link for us okay. here because our next video comes from Mark Wright who's the director of science at WWF and he's going to be looking at all issues surrounding pollinators Hello, I'm Mark Wright and I'm the Director of Science at WWF and I want to talk a little bit today about pollinators and how wonderful they are. But let's start with a story. A couple of years ago, scientists found hidden in a piece of amber from the north of Myanmar, which used to be Burma, a small flower beetle. When they examined it underneath the microscope, they found it was coated in tiny pieces of pollen. So this is the first and earliest recorded example of a pollinator. 99 million years ago. That's over 300 times longer than mankind has been on this planet. So for all of that time, plants and insects have been working together, coexisting, co-reliant on one another, totally untroubled, until in the last 50 years ago, 
it came that system came under attack from from people so that that system is under attack from pesticide use it's under attack from land use change for farming and agriculture and so on so essentially we are we're squeezing insects of their habitat and we're denying their resources and of course that doesn't even come start to mention what might happen with climate change so what does that look like well look in the uk so like 80% of our butterflies, and we all love butterflies, 80% of our butterflies have seen declines either in their abundance or their range since, since I was a boy. Of course, we know that insects and plants are inextricably linked. You know, we, the landscape and wildlife are absolutely joined. So it's not just the insects which are under pressure, but the plants are too. Look at our wildflower meadows. Those beautiful kind of colours, those lowland areas, which again, I remember as a boy, 97% of those have been lost in this country. And yet those, those meadows, they were the source of, kind of sustenance for over 1,400 different types of insect. So if we protect the plants, we can protect the insects, protect the insects, we can protect the plants. Let's, let's focus in again on, on pollinators now. So, so why are we focusing on them particularly? Well, selfishly, it's because most of our fruit and vegetables to some extent rely on pollinators for their production. But of course they're also critically important for many of the plants we love, for the, the woodland trees that we love in the countryside. They are critical for that too. And it doesn't just allow production of fruit and vegetables, they do something rather clever. It, imp it improves the quality and the amount of production as well. So one study on apples, for example, showed that having insects to do the pollination increased production threefold as well as increasing the size of the apples and the quality, the taste of the apples as well. And of course pollinators do this for free. It's what we call an ecosystem service. In the UK we estimate that service is worth about £680 million every year. So why wouldn't we want to protect that investment? And we know also that we are, within the UK, there's a trend towards more plant-based diets. And so what that means is because insects pollinate those plants that we are now increasingly eating, and that, that area under those that vegetables has increased by a third in the last few decades, so pollinators will become increasingly more important. But I do want you to remember, we're not just talking about bees here. You know, there are many, or a whole multitude of insects are pollinators, whether it's bees, wasps, butterflies, moths, and also some things we don't really like so much, like houseflies and mosquitoes also have important... Thank you very much, Mark. And we'll be returning to Mark right later to hear about his own growing journey. Now, we've got some more photos to show you um, that have been sent in by Mary Garrett. And these are photos of her wildlife haven. And she hopes they will inspire others to go wild. And thank you very much, Mary, for sending these in. I particularly like the heron uh, sculpture statue there um, and surrounded by all that lovely greenery. What a brilliant setup um, you've got there. And remember, you can share your wild photos on social media using hashtag MyWildSpace. And of course, you can download the Wild Weekender guide on the Saving Our Wild Isles website. And look in our YouTube chat for links. We'll pop, we're regularly popping them in there so you can see where you can get hold of all this great stuff. Lots more coming up this, after, uh, this morning. And um, we've got more demos coming. And um, right now, we're going to head back over to the demo area uh, where Adrian has got a very special guest. Pleased to introduce Tatian Hayden Smith to you, who I know best from BBC Two, BBC Two and the work that you've done in garden design and the fact that you went to the Chelsea Flower Show. Some people might know you more for your footballing, or some people might know you more for your community gardening, which we're going to learn more about later, aren't we? Uh, lovely to have you here. This little session that we've got now is all about the fact, a little bit earlier, I got to make an origami plant pot. This is what we uh, produced earlier, but that would only satisfy us for an early part of a, a plant career. And obviously when you get to a plant that's reached this size, you need something more. But it's not all about plastic, is it? No, it's not. We can use all types of materials and all types of things that you wouldn't even think of um, to create planters. Have you got some examples for us that you might oh, have brought? It's funny you say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a, a welly that works perfectly for uh, planting up something. Um, you've got some depth and you've got some space to grow something there. Uh, and if it outgrows the welly, then you can't, of, of course, you can then transplant it somewhere else. 
but key tip is yep. always to make sure that there's irrigation. So yes. I'm not going to turn this one upside down because it might make a mess, but we've got some holes in the bottom of the welly to ensure that there's drainage uh, for the plants that you're going to put in there, otherwise they might not do so well. And when I have trod in a bog wearing wellingtons and water's gone over the top they do hold water really well don't they so and that's the thing you don't want the plant sat in there well you've gone slightly more creative with me but i've gone slightly artistic so i've taken um this would have been uh, have a, a pack of grapes in it but it would have been clear-sided uh, and if you plant it into a clear-sided thing like this then the roots wouldn't gravitate out towards the clear sides so i've taken an old calendar and just wrapped it around the the outside um what do you think so you've turned a, a pot full of fruit into something that's going to fruit. Amazing. Lovely. That'd Love be it. great if that had been a strawberry pot to start with. Have you got anything else that you might like to show us? Yeah, so we've got a, a kid's play hat right here. Again, this is not something that you'd typically uh, use as a planter, but I wouldn't put this on your head with, whilst <laughs> there's soil in there. Great tip. <laughs> but yeah, this is, this is an amazing um, way of growing and getting kids involved. Um, you know, it's really playful and you can get super creative with all types of things. So um, I think this would be, this would make for a really good planter for some herbs. And so, so the basic principles, you need drainage in it. Is, is the size of the planter important? Well, I think it's all about understanding the size that you've got and then adapting it to the plants that might suit, best suit the size um, of whatever you're using. So um, here I might use a smaller herb, um, maybe some rosemary or uh, some basil. Um, but yeah. But it doesn't need a large root run for it? No, yeah, not yeah. at all. So it's all about getting creative, really, with things that you can grow in. Uh, and I think that's great, because whilst we've been using plant pots today, which are in these recyclable pots, I'm so keen that we, we, we don't even get to the recycle point. We just reuse what we've got already. Well, one thing I will say about nature, we'll always find a way. And I mean, look around, and we're in a space that typically wouldn't be seen as somewhere that you could be planted up. I see tr trees grows up, grow out of little cracks and crevices. Yeah. So actually, let's break the walls, let's try different things. And if it fails, then try something else. Perfect. Right, we'll be back with Tation later for some more sessions. But right now, we're going to go to a video with my RSPB Scotland co colleague, James Silby, who's created his own mini nature reserve. I guess this is a very typical average suburban garden and it's just the things that I've done to it that make it a little bit different. So there's three principles to the garden and that's that it's got to be organic so there's uh, there's no pesticides, no herbicides and it's either got to be good for me in the form of fruit and veg or it's got to be good for wildlife and if it doesn't hit those three things then it doesn't come in. So in this, in this example where we are at the moment, all the houses kind of back onto one another. So the, the green space is actually massive and it's a patchwork uh, of, of different areas. So across, when you times that up across the whole of the UK, you know, the gardens are, are a massive resource for wildlife, absolutely huge. They, you know, without a doubt, they're comparable to some of the biggest nature reserves that we have um, and they're on people's doorsteps. Start small. And I mean, the, the result of this garden is just little bits year on year. So when I first started, it was, yeah, it was all lawn, it was all roses. So I just started taking small patches out and replacing them with things that I thought would be better for wildlife. And that's, that's what people can do. The ultimate thing is just, just start. Even if it's just a plant pot of lavender uh, that will attract in the bees, then, then go for it. It'll, you'll be amazed at the difference you make, even just small little changes. And welcome back. I'm with Tation again. And a lot of today has been about growing things. And we've looked at how that creates the foundation of the, the great biodiversity of life. But if some of you out there are thinking, well, I don't have green fingers. It's all well for you and you, you grow all of these lovely lush things. Well, I can tell you for nothing that I don't have green, green fingers. I don't claim to have that at all. But we've got some little tips for you of things that you can do to enhance your growing ability. And I'm going to turn to you, Tation, to start with. What tip would you give people to give them confidence about growing things? Well, I'd definitely say um, grow something that you could eat. Um, some of the best food that I've ever eaten and stuff that have come out of the garden. Um, now, I don't have a massive garden. I have a little balcony. And actually, we've worked in a school previously where we've grown strawberries, chard, kale, beetroot, um, a whole variety of food. And um, yeah, it's really nice to, to be able to share that food as well. So especially growing food in a communal space or on your windowsill, then you'll be able to take that food for yourself and maybe share it out to some people that um, you love. 
and there's so much wildlife that will use those plants while they're growing and will be pollinating those plants and, and will be using the, the, uh, uh, the habitat that those plants create before you then eat it. And I love that one for them, one for us. It all works together. I'm, I'm going to expand on that a little bit and, and that eating things is obviously such a, uh, uh, an intense sensual experience. I, I like everything sensory around plants. The fact that you can touch them, stroke them. We saw lambs here earlier. And I think getting up close and personal, uh, feeling their textures, uh, smelling their perfume is a really important part of getting to know those plants. And then you'll see on that kind of daily basis how healthy they look and whether they, they need a little bit of care. Nobody, I always say, learns a language overnight. So you don't learn the language of plants overnight. And getting to know them really helps. Well, some of my some of my favourite memories are attached to kind of sensory kind of aesthetic, the sensory parts of plants. So, whether it's the the smell of grass, like when I was playing football when I was younger, or you know the texture of certain plants, and it just takes me back to those memories. Um, but yeah, another tip um, that I would uh, say would uh, to plant a seed, and I really love the symbolic meaning of planting those seeds because um, they can be seeds in your mind, they can be seeds in the ground, um, and it's all about hope and life. Um, and so yeah, I'd say plant a seed. You can do it on your windowsill. You can do it at home. You can do it pretty much anywhere. Um, and again, if it doesn't work, then uh, there's many seeds that you can um, use again. Um, but touching back on the fact of like growing your own food, that then will kind of go into seed and then you can harvest yeah. those seeds and, and uh, create some more plants. So yeah, you kind of get a, a massive yield out of one plant. Uh, and for those people who might think that seed growing is like, well, that sounds like A-level stuff, that does really difficult. Would you say it's difficult to grow things from seed? No, because um, if you look around, seeds grow without your help. So um, actually all you need to do is guide that seed in the right place at the right time with um, the lighting. And again, if it doesn't, if it doesn't um, come into life, then try again. Um, I, I'd, I'd say never stop trying. And that leads really neatly into to my final tip, which is expect some things not to work. Even the best gardeners out there, the Monty Dons of this world, they're not going to get everything to grow. And so celebrate those things that really do grow because they clearly like your conditions and they like you and your nurturing touch. Uh, and don't worry about the ones that don't work. There's plenty of other plants to try. I think if you take those four tips that we've, we've got there and apply them to growing, it's kind of, just give it a go, isn't it? That's it, gardening is all an experiment. It's all about trial and error um, and some of the most in, you know, famous um, gardeners have made the most errors and that's why they've come to learn so much. Um, it's all about getting stuck in and getting your hands in the soil. Perfect. What we've seen is that growing things for wildlife is the foundation of it and we need it more than ever because our wildlife is struggling. And we heard a little bit about pollinators from Dr Mark Wright a little bit earlier and here's the second half of this video about what we can do to help pollinators. So what can we do about that? Well, I'd like to give you an, an example from, from my own personal experience of what I try to do to promote kind of the, the rebirth, the regrowth of pollinators and plants in, in my immediate neighbourhood. I live in a 1960s semi-detached house on a housing estate. So this is not you know, the most beautiful part of the country at all. This is, you know, I'm surrounded by buildings. But I thought there was potential to do something there. So just over a year ago, I decided to rip out the front lawn entirely. So it's clear, clear earth. And then I left it so that all the weeds could come through. And over a period of maybe two months, every time the plants came up, I pulled it up, I pulled it up, I pulled it up, hoping that I would have clear earth so that when I did sow the meadow plants, that they would have less competition. So then I sowed it, but then of course you have to protect it from all the birds. We have a lot of wood pigeons around us who are desperate to eat this stuff. So I, I scavenged an old tent frame and some of that orange mesh that you see on building sites from a local skip and covered my, my garden in this, much to the bemusement of many of my uh, neighbours. And I should say, actually, one of the things I had to do with all my neighbours, who were very proud gardeners, was explaining what I was doing, because to be fair, our house did look a little bit like a squat for several months. But they were intrigued and they were happy to go with it. So we managed to protect the land from the, from the pigeons, and after a few months, we did see some of the, the plants coming through. And actually, by the end of the summer, we had this absolute riot of colour. It was just, I, I, I didn't expect to see something happen so quickly, if I'm being honest. But we saw this really glorious growth of diversity just within in, in, in the garden. And it meant that we were seeing things which I hadn't seen before in the garden. Hummingbird hawk moths. 
numerous types of, of, of hoverfly. There's one called Ringia, which is like got a Pinocchio-type nose. There's another one that looks exactly like a hornet. But in fact, is a totally harmless fly. Things which I have never seen in the garden before were already starting to come back in again. So then uh, what you have to then do is just sit back and enjoy. And also remember, for all the things that you do see, those new things arriving, there's many, many other things that you don't see, the small bugs and creatures, things that are scurrying around on the ground. So for every one thing which is new and you're, you're happy about, there's 10 others which are benefiting from this as well. But this, I think, maybe it's a few things to think about if you're thinking of doing something similar about that, things to consider. The first is make sure that when you buy your plants or your seed, that it's not being soaked in pesticides. I'm bizarrely, if you go to many of the garden centres, they have these plants marked as, you know, Pollinate, uh, plants for pollinators. They look really nice, and they look nice because they've been treated heavily with pesticides. Of course, that's the last thing you want to put in your garden. So just check the provenance of these things before you plant them. I would say, and I'm sorry if this is a heresy, don't be slavish about just having native plants. And of course, try and pr prioritize those that really we're looking for diversity, lots of difference. The more diversity we have, the greater, it, the better it is for the, for the animals as well. But also don't just think about flowers. So in my, in my case, 70% of the seed mix was grasses, native grasses. We don't want the, some of the, the grasses we have on a standard lawn. Because if you think about a meadow, it's not just a flower bed. It's that mixture of grasses and plants. And it makes it much more natural and it's much better for the insects as well. But also I would say, don't be, don't be afraid about letting nature take its course I mean, you, you'll plant it but let nature follow its own way so don't th don't get upset if you don't get species x or species y because for everyone you didn't get you will get something you weren't expecting let nature just choose its own future so as an, as an aside it's not a meadow i when i first moved into my house 20 years ago i put a bat box on the side of the house we've never had any bats in it for the last three or four years we've had sparrows nesting in it and i'm delighted about it so you know don't be too concerned if the wrong thing turns up because anything is good and I do recognize that for many of you or many of us we don't maybe don't have a garden that we can rip apart and you know we live in a you know, uh, in a pond or something like that so I would really urge you to even if you have a window box anything of any scale is good for you and I know someone asked me the other day they said well how do I know what to put in how will I know what, what will flower Okay. I was given a really simple tip, and when I was told, I thought, that is brilliant. I'm going to share it with you. So every month, go to the garden centre, look at what's in flower, and buy that. So then you will have something in flower year-round, you know, 12 months a year, you'll have something out there. So just to finish with, I would say that, honestly, no matter, because of the pressures that our natural world is under, no matter what you do, no matter at what scale, it will have a benefit, and nature they will, nature will love you for it. Brilliant ideas there from Mark, and I particularly like the one about visiting a garden centre every month to see what's in flower, so you know that you can keep your pollinators fed all year round. And Tatian's come to join me. Hello, Tatian. Hello, hello. Um, now, we are going to show you the mystery insect picture again now, and I will reveal what it is. And some of you did get the answer right on YouTube in the comments, so well done. So this is, in fact, a dark-edged bee fly. Um, so fluffy little thing, they come out in early spring, great big pointy bit coming out of the face, and people are often intrigued by what these things are. Have you ever seen one of these, Station? Do you know what, I haven't. No, well, th you, now you know to look out for one. <laughs> and it's like a little bumble, but it's like a little fluffy bee, but then it, you just see this little proboscis kind of thing that, that pokes out of it, and people are freaked out by them quite often. <laughs> what is this thing? Um, but they're fascinating insects, because what they do is they parasitize uh, solitary bees. So. Uh, we've talked about solitary bees earlier. So they, this, a solitary bee will lay her egg in a hole. The, the bee fly will come along, <laughs> scoot up to it, sometimes roll its egg in a bit of sand or get, and just flick its own egg into the hole. <laughs> so its own, its, own, its own larva will take over. Hijack. Hey, hijack. It's very <laughs> sneaky, but incredibly cute. I'm sure you will agree. Now, we've got some more lovely photos to show you. These are from Carol Rio. Um, who sent them in to us and Carol said in order to bring more wildlife to our area which was just a disused community green I've been working with a com community council and established a wildlife garden and there's a long list here I won't read it to all but she's got pond bee boxes frog and toad sanctuary sapling trees bird feeding stations bird baths she's done incredibly well here and um, we only dug the pond last year so I'm still getting it established she says and it's I mean it's looking good it's a good start it just needs a bit more leafage which will develop over time won't it it will come 
Um, the community council gave us the raised beds and the lovely potting shed, two compost bins and a water bath. Oh, then left me to get on with it, but it sounds like you're enjoying it, Carol. So thank you very much for sending that in. Look good, didn't it? Yeah, it's I, lovely. Yeah, I like it when people make an effort like this. It's great. And thank you all for sending your photos in. Remember, you can share them on social media using My Wild Space. We'll be coming back to chat to Tation about his work a little bit later. But first of all, we're going to go over to Jenny and Adrian with tips on portable planters. Hello. Well, I'm back. I've just had a donut and it was lovely. Um, <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> sorry, I should have brought you one. Well, we're going to talk about pots. Now, pots are your friend if you're at that time in your life uh, where you're moving house a lot. And you maybe want to take your plants with you when you go. So, portable planters, what's your advice, Adrian? Yeah, and the thing is that once plants have really grown, a lot of plants that we've shown here today will really bulk out and if you really love them then you're probably willing to hire a fleet of uh, removal vehicles to take them with you but for most people they need to take a smaller amount of their garden with them but probably want to take the essence of the garden with them mm. and there are various ways of doing things the first thing is that you may indeed take whole planters for example if you planted up a hanging basket then obviously that can be immediately unhooked and carried with you sure. so the thing that I would say here is uh, the difference between compost and soil and I think that for many people they think what is the difference between yeah, those things? Good question. And the thing is that compost is green material. It's decomposing green uh, material that is quite light and easy to transport. Soil has broken down rock within it. It's actually finely ground rock okay. with green material within it. So make sure if you do need to move stuff, use peat-free compost, mm -hmm. fill your planters with it, and it'd be much more transportable because it'd be that much lighter when you do it. Sensible advice. The other thing that you can do is if you've got favourite plants, it's amazing how amenable plants are to creating mini plants that you can take with yes. them. Yes. Now I'd love to get your advice on this. Yeah. Yeah, go on. Uh, we've been following our Wild Weekend a plant list through on the way. All of these are on, on the list and we're back at Catmint, which I know you're going to start rubbing and sniffing <laughs> and I am too. This one is a really easy plant to take cuttings from. And this is propagating, is it? You can call it propagating, you okay. can call it cutting, you can call it creating little plants for, for free. Yeah. Whatever you I want like to this. call it. Free plants, okay. Uh, and all it is, is taking, here's, here's rule number one, if this has got flowers on it, don't take it with uh, a stem with flowers on it. Fine. Because the plant is busy ploughing all its energy into the flowers. What you want is to take a non-flowering stem, you cut it, cut off the lower leaves, drop it in the edge of a pot of compost or into a, a, a glass of water. That's what I've done before and a few little roots start to sprout. Yeah, yeah. Now it doesn't always work. No. <laughs> with something like a cat mint, you've got a really good chance of creating a mini plant really quickly and as soon as you see roots emerge or new leaves beginning to grow, then you know that it's taken is yeah. the word for it okay. and you've got a new cutting. My advice on that is hmm? do lots of them because I did, I mean if you do like five or six or something and only four of them get roots then fine because um, it is a bit hit and miss sometimes mm. isn't it but yeah I've done that before and they do sprout roots literally just put them in some water and yeah dead easy free plants second thing on free plants is that some plants and we're back to our hookah here our woodland plant some of them are what are called dividable yep so instead of taking a, a, a cutting and cutting off a, a, a stem what you're actually looking for is the fact that there's actually several mini plants. They might all be joined by roots at this stage, but they can be teased apart from each other. And I can see that this hookera is probably oh, about yeah. five or six individual plants, which could all be teased apart Divided and create up. a mini plant. And when you okay. consider that hookeras might be at the point where you take your divisions, really quite a big plant, and you want to take a little one with you, it's really easy to do so. And you can be using your little origami Indeed. pot to take your garden with you. And is there a good or a bad time of year to do that? Um, so uh, you can take uh, divisions, uh, ideally spring, mm -hmm. possibly autumn, but you can give it a go at any point in the year and see what works because people can't judge it according to when they're moving. Yeah, of course. I've got one final tip <laughs> yeah. for moving your plants around. <laughs> what do you think? Well, it's a novel idea. I mean, you couldn't fit many in it, but I don't know. Jamie and Tasha, what do you think? 
I think that looks rather fun. I, I think I probably would want some sort of pole attached, otherwise you're bending over trying to push the thing along as you're moving your plants. But I love the idea of portable planters. What, what, some, some brilliant little tips there. Thank you so much. Um, Tation is back with us and I'm going to grill him now on some of his amazing work. So grow to know. Tell me all about that. Yeah, so um, Grow to Know is my baby, um, yeah. and it's a non-profit um, which I set up um, after realising the um, unifying and healing powers of nature yeah. uh, immediately after the Grenfell Tower fire. So yeah. I'm born and raised in Labrook Grove, West London, yeah. and um, took to the streets after um, the Grenfell Tower fire, and um, you know just to find solace, to, to, to seek understanding, clarity, and um, obviously a lot of community members were feeling angry and mm. sad um, and understandably so and um, yeah a lot of them took to the streets and people expressed themselves through art so whether it was kind of painting on walls or um, you know doing craft um, and for some reason this kind of barren derelict land was like a, a raised bed a bricked raised bed mm. um, in what was called Maxilla yeah. um, just under the Westway um, yeah. the motorway so typically people knew me from playing football at the Westway and so all of a sudden I'd swap my, my football boots for my gardening boots and um, found myself in this plot of land, started to tidy up a bit, you know, pick up the rubbish. And that soon evolved into um, asking local, local garden centres and, and nurseries for plants. Um, and so I didn't really know what I was doing, had no clue what the plants were called, um, but was just freestyling. And what I found was, at the very least, people would walk past and share a smile. Yeah. Um, they'd stop for a conversation, and that five-minute conversation would turn into ten minutes, and that yeah. would turn into half an hour, and then all of a sudden you're exchanging details, and then uh, we turned it into a weekly um, you know, kind of event where people could come down into the gorilla garden. So um, you know, I was dubbed the Grenfell Gorilla Gardener at the time, and uh, we went on to take, take over five different spaces um, in, in inner city London, Labrick Grove, um, and I just realised there and then how amazing nature is and how it can bring people together, how you can tell stories through nature, but also it's a two-way relationship with the environment, with the ecology, um, and it's not a thing where we need to see ourselves out the, outside the circle of life. We are part of that kind of ecology, um, and the sooner we realise that, the more respect we'll have for our own local spaces, especially in Labrick Grove, where in places like Labrick Grove, where there's not too much green space and we're mm. not really taught about it because we're we're in survival mode growing up like yeah. much, you know we didn't have much growing up yeah. so actually creating capacity for those conversations and and creating space for those conversations to really thrive um i think is important for our work at grow to know i think it, oh, that's, that's absolutely brilliant i think what i'm fascinated by is that was that the beginning of your growing journey you sort of felt instinctively drawn to plants so it wasn't something from childhood you didn't grow up around gardeners and gardening well I always say that my mum was a big inspiration, a big influence. Yeah. Um, my mum's no longer with us anymore. Um, uh, she, she was terminally ill from about the age of 12 mm -hmm. and she had this deep appreciation for nature. So yeah. she, she was fully aware of the yeah. kind of the effects um, that nature will have on your mind, on your body, on your soul. Um, and would, you know, we, in, in Labrick Grove where there's not that many trees and where there's not that many gardens and yeah. plants, um, you know, she'd point out the one tree in the road and go, yeah. like, look at that beautiful texture of the bark or can you hear the birds singing? And she loved her sunsets. And I think at a time of, um, you know, need and of real trauma, um, it was nature that I turned to. And I don't yeah. think that's by coincidence. I mean, we had a really small garden um, and the gardening was never a, a word, neither was horticulture. Um, but my mum used to grow lavender and we planted an avocado seed which then turned into a massive tree. Um, so there's bits of, of the garden which still take me back to memories with mum. Um, and I think that uh, my mum definitely had a big influence on my love for nature. So gardening wasn't really on the horizon, but um, I, when, when you look back on it, like, yeah. it really does make sense. Um, yeah. You just reminded me of growing avocados from the sea. I think we've all, we've all tried it. And it's like, <laughs> did, did you ever get fruit from it? No, I tell you what, we didn't, because we, we compost. We used yeah, to yeah, compost at yeah. home. And I say we planted a seed, we threw the seed into the garden. <laughs> yeah. um, so, and, but it, it now towers over the building. That's amazing. Um, uh, it hasn't fruited yet, yeah. but um, Who knows? Got fruit. Yeah. But I know that in, in Labrick Grove especially, but I think because of the warmer climate, yeah. um, I've seen pomegranates growing. I've wow. seen, there are avocado trees that yeah. fruit. Um, there's all kinds of fruiting trees that you wouldn't expect to fruit. So, um, but it, it very much touches on the kind of the way that the climate's going and yeah. how, um, you know, actually we need to be a bit more climate resilient with uh, not understanding about spaces. And uh, one thing that Grow to Know is looking at is how we can uh, bring community um, plants, people and places together um, to kind of redesign and reclaim um, space, um, especially in urban settings. 
So what tips would you give to people in urban settings? What's any, any kind of key planting ideas for people who want to get started? Well, for me, it's more about um, a movement. It's more about a mindset. Yeah. And I think, actually, if you live in, in a kind of a council estate or a very um, densely populated space, um, I'd say speak to your neighbours because mm. uh, you're always bound to find someone who's a really enthusiastic plant lover or someone who has a patch somewhere. And I think gardens are, are kind of like what I like to call the common ground, uh, whether that's a balcony, whether that's a windowsill, whether that's an outdoor public green space. Um, and actually, this is where we can relate with each other. So we did a Chelsea Flower Show garden last year and um, at, at Chelsea Flower Show we found that and, and we, we did a garden that was uh, touching on really sensitive topics around rac racial injustice but also um, environmental injustice through deforestation of mangroves and we found because it was a beautiful garden people were more open and more warm to the idea of having that conversation because people would go what's that plant, um, what, what's that beautiful flower over there, what's this garden about and actually yeah. I think gardens are the way of unlocking that kind of those boundaries, those barriers yeah. um, and so in terms of tips, I'd, I'd use it as a way of kind of communicating, telling stories, um, and that's how I learned in that kind of first gorilla garden, where um, you know elders would come into the garden and go, "Oh, that plant reminded me of my, my time back in Jamaica," or yeah. "That plant was something that my mum used to grow in yeah. um, Poland," or you know, and people of all different cultures could then connect through um, gardening. And so, yeah, we're building bridges here and, and breaking down barriers, and also gardening or growing plants. You can do it whatever your level of knowledge, can't you? And you've, you've shown that now. Well, one thing I will say is when I first started to um, garden in that space, I was quite embarrassed. I was quite ashamed because there some, there's some kind of preconceived ideas of who a gardener could be, um, who it should be. Um, and I think that definitely needs shifting. And I think um, by being in this space and by seeing people of a similar age to me and um, of a similar background to me getting stuck into the garden, it makes me realise that we're all gardeners. And yeah. actually, it just takes kind of the, that planting that seed to unlock that. Yeah. Um, so I think no matter your age, no matter your background, no matter who you are, where you're from and what you're doing, um, I think there's, there's space for, for gardening in everyone's life. Thank you so much, Tayshan, and thank you for sharing your story. It's been brilliant, thank you. Thank you for having me. We've got one final set of photos now from uh, one of our viewers, and this is from Tom Wilmot in Bristol. He has got a mini wildflower roof on the storage container, and um, we're going to put that up on the screen for you now. You can see Ragged Robin, uh, Ragwort and Bugle in here. Uh, wonderful. And I just, I just love this. It just, this is the journey of a bee. This is the journey a bee might make through Tom's mini wildflower meadow, just on a roof. Isn't this incredible? Lovely pink, bright uh, Ragged Robin there, one of my favourites. Back to Adrian and Jenny now, and we're going to be talking about water for wildlife. Is that beer or...? No, it's just water, don't worry. It is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the elixir of life, as oh, I like to think about indeed. it. Indeed, and such an important element to add to any garden, no matter what the size. Absolutely. Uh, we've talked so much about plants, and yet this, for me, is the other magic ingredient mm -hmm. of it all. Um, it's, it's the thing that when you put water into the garden, suddenly wildlife flocks to it, and it doesn't have to be complicated either. No. So I thought we'd, we'd start by talking about water at its most simplest, which is, I have it as, as a drink in this way, all it takes is a little saucer in the garden filled with water. I thought this one was particularly good. That's okay, beautiful. <laughs> the water might flow through those, but great for, for birds with their little uh, claws to cling to and take a, yeah. a drink from a bird bath. Bees as well will drink from a saucer of water, won't they? Uh, they will indeed, yeah. Particularly put some little pebbles in there and it gives them little points to, to perch on yeah. when they drink from it. I, I visited a, a garden a couple of years ago. I, I've got lots of ponds in my garden, I've got some bird baths, and yet this garden had got little saucers everywhere. Nice. And every one was being visited by, by something. There's out something there. really lovely about watching a bird having a bath as well. Like, honestly, I just use little drip trays, and um, yeah, when a blackbird turns up and has a little bath in that or a blue tit is ever so cute. <laughs> if you can graduate from that though to yep. a pond you suddenly get to a new layer because uh -huh. that might be good, a little saucer might be good for the birds but it's not going to work for dragonflies and damselflies and frogs and toads and newts and sure. all the other pond wildlife that comes when you've got a water body that's got some plants in it. And I think for many people they then think that sounds a bit complicated yeah, and expensive. that is next level isn't it? Or is it? It's next level, but it doesn't need to be difficult whatsoever. Okay. And I think that people are surprised how quickly you can create a pond. You could take, for example, an old Belfast sink or even uh, a watertight plant pot. And as long as you ensure that wildlife, should it fall in, but doesn't want to be in there, can get out again, mm -hmm. and do that with some bricks and some rocks to create in and out roots from yeah. the water, 
then you've got the chance to start adding plants to your pond and that takes you to a new level of growing and it's those plants that will provide the habitat for the newts to lay their eggs in mm -hmm. and stems for the dragonflies to crawl up when they emerge from the pond and everybody without fail who I've spoken to who's put a pond in their garden no matter what size whether it be a great whopping one I was lucky enough to dig one that's 15 meters long oh, in off. my garden it took me six <laughs> months to do oh, it wow. <laughs> yeah. down to a little one a little one is still going to have a lot of life yeah. that comes visiting it it is amazing how much will be attracted to just a small bit of water and bats as well they all will they'll come to sort of feast upon the insects that are flying around it so yeah it's really really beneficial I think what we need to also touch on in the water issue is the fact great to have a wet wetland habitat within the garden but we need to be careful with water as well obviously we're in that changing climate we saw the yeah. temperatures that we had last year and some of the plants that we've shown today and that we've uh, ad advise that they're great ones to look out for because they're multi-value and I'm going to pick out here we're going to go back to um, well let's go to our telephium actually uh, our high low telephium our sedum this has got fleshy leaves it's um, a kind of Mediterranean plant mm -hmm. so it can cope with really hot weather and I think our gardens in the future if we're to really look after our water sources are going to have to focus on these plants that can cope with the droughts that are going to come our way. Yeah. And here's one that is storing water in, our le in its leaves so that in dry periods it keeps on going. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our catmint would do really well and our lamb's ear. I mentioned earlier, this is a plant from Southeast Europe. This is where it grows. So it can cope really, really hot summers. The fluff on the leaves may be good for our wool cardabies, may be good for me as I go out and stroke them, but it also stops the leaves from drying out and desiccating in really sunny weather. Fantastic. And lavender's another good one, I think, isn't it? Another Mediterranean herb. Yes. yes. Ah, interesting. That's worth bearing in mind, yeah, considering the summer we had last year. Um, well, we do actually have a question uh, from Kylie on YouTube, and she would like to know what plants should she add to her pond? Ah, yes. And uh, you've got lots of choices, but I'm just going to throw a little warning in to start with in that what we're seeing are some invasive non-native species in our wetland systems that can go out of control so you do need to be careful not to plant those so go to a reputable supplier when you get your plan yep. plants don't just take them from any pond in the world don't don't do that and but then you've got some wonderful things like irises that come yes. out of the water they're called emergent plants they're not submerged at all uh, uh, lovely yellow flowers uh, a native plant but what you also want are some plants that are aquatic plants that are under the surface mm -hmm. uh, and we have some wonderful native plants that can do that in particular hornwort is my right. favorite it's like quite feathery and green and creates these long tassels these long cat's tails under the surface and once you've added those to a pond often in the first year of a pond when you put a pond in you get what's called blanket weed or algae yeah. growing yeah and I say to people don't worry about that because your pond actually at the moment is a bowl of fresh water <laughs> that's just been put out in the countryside yeah. it takes years for a, for a pond to really settle in and for the plants in it to grow so give it time don't worry about that blanket weed to start with you can twiddle it around a stick and, and remove it if you need to but allow those aquatic plants to grow and they create this stable conditions within the pond with, with my 15 meter pond first year loads of blanket weed I'm now year six and I've got to a stage where I'd happily bend down and drink the water from it oh wow nature <laughs> well please don't <laughs> <laughs> or do that at home <laughs> in, yeah, leave that to me leave the dangerous <laughs> stuff with me um, but it nature has created uh, the, the conditions that over time this balance and we've talked about balance before during, yes, during yeah this morning's broadcast nature creates the balance if you give it time whether it's in your pop-up meadow whether it's in your flower borders whether it's in your pond what's the best thing you've seen at your pond wildlife wise uh, wildlife wise you would not believe the daily activity that happens this week the best thing was a little egret and people oh, will go oh wow. your garden must be in a really wild place I'm in the middle of suburbia but little egrets come regularly to my pond the best thing ever I put a stick in the pond in the middle of it and I called it a kingfisher stick, imagining that kingfishers weren't going to arrive Come there. On. Now I, I'd love to say that they had. And they did! Really? Kingfisher oh, nice. arrived in my garden. They've come three times in the middle of suburbia. That's so cool. God, imagine a kingfisher in your garden. I would absolutely love that. Uh, and I, I don't say it as a show off. I, show, I say it <laughs> as put a pond in 
and I think you'll be amazed by what comes. Yes. You might not get a Kingfisher, but you'll get something that intrigues you. Yes, indeed. Great, and that's great actually to awaken some, you know, intrigue and sense of, you know, curiosity. That's what it's all about as well. Mm. Well, we're going to go now to a great guy. He's the Brian Cox of the gardening universe. He's Manchester's answer to Monty Don. Here's young gardener George Hassel, who's going to show us about sowing seeds. Hiya, I'm George and the Wild Weekender has finally arrived. Now, I'm here in my garden doing some essential weekend jobs. Now, if you're new to planting seeds and growing seeds and you're not too familiar with the terminology, I'm here to try and explain. The information on the back of seed packets is brilliant. It shows you its height, its colour and so on and so on. The information is really, really important because it can tell you when to sow the seeds, which means when you start to grow them, when you expect the flowers or when you expect to harvest the veg and also there's even a date. Now, to be fair, I've used seeds that are way out of date and do sometimes work, but to give yourself the best chance, it's always best to stick to the date. There's also other information such as when to thin the seedlings, which means giving them enough space to grow and germinate. These are cornflowers, great for bees, and their seeds are so unique. Cornflowers are annuals, annual meaning year, which means they germinate, start to grow, flower, set seed and die all in one season. Now, you can start them off in pots or trays and keep them on a window bottom or greenhouse, or you can actually directly sow them into the ground, which we've done over here. And that means that you've got two chances of watching these beauties grow. There's loads of seeds in this packet, so to keep costs down, swap with your gardening mates. Also, reuse trays and pots, just make sure you wash them out first. You can even use old food containers as pots, just make sure they've got holes in the bottom for drainage. Of course, you don't have to buy seeds to grow plants, you can even collect your own. Now these are honesty seeds and they come in their own little natural paper-like wrapper. Now honesty are a biannual plant. Now biannual, what does that mean? It basically means that in their life cycle it usually takes two years. So for the first year you should expect leaves and then in the second year you should expect beautiful purple flowers which are great for bees. Now let's talk perennial plants. Now perennial means when they grow, flower and die back year after year. In our garden, we have epimedium and hellebore, which were both gifts by dividing plants. Now dividing is where you cut it in half, which does seem quite brutal, but it works. Now I live in Manchester and we can get all four seasons in one day. Now the seed packet will tell you if your plant is hardy. And being hardy basically means it's tolerance to surviving cold, hot, dry, wet or even wind. Make sure you research where your plant is best placed. That could be in full sun, full shade or even partial shade. Dry or damp areas. And some plants need very little attention and they just come back year after year like magic. What do we grow our seeds in? Compost. We have our own compost area where we mix fruit and veg peelings and garden waste, such as leaves and even a bit of cardboard. But not everyone has the space to make their own, so you can buy seed compost from garden centres or online, but make sure it's peat free. Using peat-free compost means we are conserving such important ecosystems whilst also enjoying our gardens. You might have heard the words free draining. Basically, it means to allow the water to drain slowly through without water pooling and puddling. That's what these herbs require. Use a mix of compost, sand or, if you have any, horticultural grit or small stones. I 
Hope I've inspired you to get growing this wild weekend. What will you grow? Good luck and grow well. Thank you very much, George. That was absolutely fantastic. And thank you for deciphering seed packets for those of us who get a little bit confused. Jenny and Adrian have joined me over here in the studio area. Have you been enjoying Wild Weekend Alive? It's been great. It's been really fun. Yeah, we've had a fab time. And it's been really great to hear you guys asking us questions. Really pleased that you're interested and to see what you've been doing at home, because that's what it's all about, isn't it? Inspiring everybody to do their bit, however small. Uh, I was so chuffed to meet Tation and I hope that we've given you some ideas of things that you can do that are really easy and will genuinely make a difference because nature needs us and it starts at home. Exactly. It, it really, really does. And, and you, you can, can find, find out more information, information in the Wild Weekend Guide. We've been mentioning, mentioning all morning. We'll pop the link in the chat for you. You can also share your wild pictures. Keep doing that over the weekend on social media using the hashtag MyWildSpace. You can also help nature by adding your voice to the People's Plan for Nature, uh, a plan for nature by the people. Um, peoplesplanfornature.org, all the details are on there. Do have a look. It's an absolutely fantastic piece of work and it's something that I think we should all get behind. I'd like to say a massive thank you now to everyone who's been involved in Wild Weekend Alive. There is a huge team. You can't see them. There's a huge team. We're going to wave behind the scenes. Thank you so much. You've been working incredibly hard over the last few weeks and days um, to make this all come together as it has done so beautifully. And we'd also like to thank the National Trust Castlefield Viaduct team for hosting us. They have been so hospitable friendly, so warm and just really looked after us in their beautiful, beautiful sight. And thank you. Thank you all for watching. Bye bye.